Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, October 10th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. Um, I want to begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz? Yes. Ms. Molly Burnham? Here. Ms. Rebecca Musanski? Here. Ms. Laura Fallon? Present. Uh, Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Here. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Ms. Susan Boss? Here. Mr. Edward Zahowski? Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. I do need to let the uh, folks here in the audience know that this meeting is being um, audio and video recorded. Um, we now have our public comment period. Um, so those uh, members of the public who wish to speak, if you would, um, we don't have anyone signed, no one signed up. So, no one signed up. so if no, okay, certainly. If you haven't signed up, it's okay. You can, you can still come forward. Okay. Um, we were discussing who was going to go first. Okay. If you could just uh, state your name and address for the record. And, yes, and um, she just before. I would ask, um, I'll have a three minute timer, so we we'll just ask people to please keep their remarks done for three minutes. All right. Thanks. Hi, my name is Francie Lynn. Did you want me to state my address? Sure. Okay, my address is 120 Hillcrest Drive in Florence. Um, and I apologize if this sounds disjointed because I didn't come with anything prepared. But um, I'm here. Um, I have a second grader at Leeds Elementary. And I'm here because I'm very concerned about some issues that he's been facing in the classroom that I think have to do with um, partly with class size, but also with a lack of support in the classroom. Um, I have been into the classroom. I used to go last year once a week when he was in first grade and then I've been in a few times this year um, and the class size is 24 which maybe doesn't sound like a lot but in that class of 24 there are a lot of kids who were more than one child in terms of attention needed they're like three or four children um, and even the most experienced teacher um, you know I mean she keeps you know pretty good control but she has to keep stopping and starting the class um, which I think is frustrating to a lot of kids. There's a lot of high-needs kids in class. She gets pulled out for conferences a lot, and a sub needs to take over for her when she does that. And when she comes back in, she kind of can't pick up the pieces again. And I see the effects of this in my own child, who is, you know, like a very quiet kid. He's not, you know, generally kind of keeps things together, holds, holds things in. Um, and I see him come home, and he's upset. He has a headache. He doesn't want to go to school in the morning, which is very unlike him because he loves school. Um, and I just worry that this is something that's really becoming an issue because um, it started happening at the end of last year. And I had hoped that this would sort of, you know, new teacher, new classroom, everything would sort things out. And that just hasn't happened. In fact, it's gotten worse. Um, and just from being in the classroom, I see also that, you know, I mean, I think when inclusion was sort of rolled out, I, it had been told to us that it was going to, you know, involve a lot of other teachers in the classroom. Um, and I feel like people kind of pop in and out, but there's not like a permanent person in the classroom who is there to like take care of things or like a permanent support teacher, um, which I think would be really helpful. Um, and I feel like the kids who are high needs um, also aren't kind of getting like the, I mean, last year when I was in the classroom, there would be like kids sort of like under the table, um, you know, who were perhaps on the spectrum or something like that. And I just feel like that, you know, they didn't get the attention they needed. The kids who were sort of more mainstream didn't get the attention they needed. And while I am fully in support of inclusion, I just feel like it is not working well um, and I've talked to many other, I tried to rally a bunch of like second grade parents to come also, although I think it was a little late notice, um, but you know, they have some issues also. And we're all huge supporters of the Northampton Public Schools and the Northampton teachers. Um, and it's painful for us to, you know, be sort of disappointed and frustrated and seeing our kids struggle this way. Um, and it's sort of across the spectrum, like the kids who are more mainstream. And I talked to like parents of high needs kids who also feel like their kids' needs aren't being met. And so I just wanted to ask you all to, you know, maybe come up with the funding to figure out more support for the teachers in the classroom. Um, and that's all I have to say for tonight. And I will put my name down here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over here. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? everyone, Kate Cardoso, 135 Hillcrest Drive. I am also here for the same reasons as Francie. My daughter is in the other second grade class at Leeds, and I think that the two second grade teachers at Leeds are the most experienced teachers at Leeds right now, and they are really struggling with the class sizes of 24 kids in each class. Uh, we did get a letter home last week that said to try and handle this situation they are splitting the kids in each class up into two groups for special reading attention so 12 and 12 
12 will be taken out of the classroom for reading and 12 will stay in with the with the teacher so it's it's a uh, it's a temporary solution to a long-term problem the second grade there are two second grades there are two third grades there are two fourth grades but outside of those there are three there are three classes um, and so there has been talk about adding a, another third grade class once the second graders go into that. I've been hearing some feedback from the teachers that they just need more support in the classroom. Uh, and it's it's even, it's an issue in the first grade too. They're, they're having to, they're kids who have, are having issues and they're having to clear the classroom to be able to deal with that. And if they had some more, a full-time resource in the classroom, they might be able to keep situations from getting out of hand like that. Uh, so I'm here with Francie trying to advocate for getting some more permanent help in the classrooms, in particular second grade at Leeds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Hi, uh, my name is Luke Ratcliffe. Uh, this is my wife, Melissa Ratcliffe. Uh, we live at 25 Leonard Street in Leeds. We're here speaking in the same vein as, um, uh, as you've been hearing. Um, our, our son and daughter are both uh, students at Leeds in second grade and kindergarten. And we've noticed um, in the last two years, the class sizes uh, in Leeds have been growing and growing, um, especially with the inclusion of the, um, or with the inclusion program. Um, I think it was promised as one thing, and I think everybody's trying to do what they can do to make it um, be what it was promised, but we're just falling short of that, and it's making for a hectic um, and, and, and loud classroom environment, especially for kids that um, generally are, are quiet, pay attention, um, they're just getting drowned out by the sheer volume, just the noise. Uh, in the classroom and uh, our son is one of them. He's a pretty quiet kid, reserved kid, and he's having a hard time focusing, um, staying on task, and actually just listening uh, to the teacher because of the uh, cacophony that's going on in the room. Um, we're concerned too with our daughter being in kindergarten. There's, um, um, I think there's three classes now, right? There's three classes now. One of them is, you know, they're, they're sort of getting larger, but the, the kindergarten, um, they have a, a great, full-time help they have uh, what is it two people in each classroom three, at least two at least two people sometimes, sometimes three. three a floating third person in each classroom but when this you know these classes move on to this uh, first grade second grade where there's only right now one teacher possibly hiring a third teacher um, for the same number of kids it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a mess like like the second grade is right now um, so we're just here to advocate for our kids thank you very much thank, thank you, you both is there anyone else? Hello, um, <clears throat> my name is Alyssa Emery Geis and um, I live on Chestnut Ave in Leeds and I have a daughter who's in fourth grade at Leeds and um, I don't have anything prepared because they were just talking about this right before the meeting. Um, but I just wanted to come in and um, echo what a lot of parents have been telling me. My children are older. Um, my daughter's in fourth grade and um, my older children are in middle school and at Smith Folk. And, um, oh my, sorry, <laughs> my alarm's going off. See, I'm not 100% prepared, but um, <laughs> my children are older and talking to people who their, their oldest child is the same, is in fourth grade and they have younger children. Um, some of the things that they're telling me about leads and happening at, at the school, I'm not hearing about because my children are not in it and some of it kind of surprises me because I know having had three kids go through leads and having had um, one of the class, my son's class was actually one that Mr. Kanata marked as particularly energetic. Um, and even with those years and the things that that, that group went through, um, it sounds like things are getting more difficult for the younger grades right now. And so, um, while I don't have direct experience in the classroom, like some of the other parents that we've just heard and other people that I have heard talking on the playground or in after, after school activities, um, I do recognize that it's coming from multiple people and multiple groups because we do different kinds of things and I have kids in different groups. So I hear different families, it's not just certain families. And um, that it is getting more difficult and that uh, that the support that our teachers need and that the students themselves need um, is not there. And so I'm just, at, I'm just here to echo what I hear and hope that you guys would consider it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment this evening? Okay. Thank you all for your uh, for your comments. Um, are there any announcements from uh, members of the school committee? Any announcements? Okay. Um, hearing none, we'll move on to the recommended actions. Uh, we have a consent agenda this evening uh, that contains the approval of the minutes of the September 12th, 2019 school committee, as well as uh, multiple field trip requests. Uh, the Leeds fifth grade uh, trip to nature's classroom in Beckett, November 5th through the 8th of 2019. The JFK chorus going to Broadway Theater in New York, New York, April 29th, 2020. The NHS choral program uh, going to uh, New York City, Broadway, West Side Story, April 1st, 2020. And then the JFK eighth graders uh, French uh, department going to Quebec City, Canada, May 22nd through the 24th, uh, 2020. Um, and then we have, um, do we have budget trans? I believe we do. No there's the no, no budget transfers on this agenda. Well, actually, there is one, but it's not on the consent agenda. Not on the agenda. consent agenda. Okay, just verifying that. So, is there a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda as uh, as presented? So moved. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Mayor? Yes. I'd like to ask that we remove um, the JFK course trip and the NHS choral program trip from the consent agenda. Okay. So, the. Um, the JFK Chorus and the NHS Choral. Those two? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Any other response? Oh, yes. I'd like to remove the meeting notes. The meeting notes. Okay. Um, anything else? Yeah, the same thing as Dr. Voss. Okay. Removing the minutes. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So. Um, so then, okay. I, I also have a question, so I guess I'll ask to remove the, the I just have a question on it, but the eighth grade French trip. Okay. So, sorry. No problem. So, um, so we're down to one less, one last remaining <laughs> item on the consent agenda. It looks to me on this agenda that the budget transfer is on the consent agenda, and I would also like to remove that. Okay. If it is, I, that's how it looks, but. Okay. Uh, um, where do you see that? I think it says maybe there's nothing under it. It's not under it. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. It just says budget transfers. Transfer. Okay. I think it's just like a standard set of headings. It caught me too. That's why okay. I was verifying. Okay. Yeah, there's no bullet under it. Um, okay. okay, so um, we're down to a consent agenda of one. Uh, that would be voting on the Leeds fifth grade uh, nature's classroom trip to Beckett. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now let's take up the um, items that were taken off. Let's take them in order. Um, the approval of minutes. Did you wish to? Um, yes, I'd like to ask to postpone it simply because I have, I, apparently they were just emailed out, but I have not seen them. Okay. I don't know. I was thinking I had missed them, but okay. if they had just come out, I just haven't had okay. time to read them, and I'd like to read them. Okay. So um, you're saying the same? Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So um, I saw them. I just haven't had a chance. Okay. So then the motion would be to um, postpone consideration until our next meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So those uh, consideration of those minutes are postponed until the next meeting. Um, next, the JFK chorus. Uh, well, actually, Ms. Fallon, do you want to raise your questions about the two, the JFK mm -hmm. Chorus and the NHS Choral Program? So I'm certainly not going to oppose the trips. I know that their kids are really excited. The planning's already happened. But um, I know we approve this on an annual basis. And I did just want to raise the question for next year. Um, um, I love the way um, they work in the curriculum framework and the standards this meets and seeing live music. but. The fact that our the students are spending three to three and a half hours each way on a bus to New York City, and then three hours to see the show seems like a lot of travel. Um, the total cost at almost eleven thousand dollars seems very expensive, and we keep talking about how the city is working and how the schools are working to do things for the environment. It seems like these opportunities are offered in Springfield and Hartford and Boston and maybe even at UMass. So I would just like to 
to say maybe we could start thinking about more local opportunities or in the Berkshires. Um, I don't know, um, because I know we've always done it and maybe there's nothing that can compare to the Broadway experience, but I know for some students and, and parents have said it, it's a struggle to be on a bus for seven hours. Um, and to then sit through a three-hour show on top of that is just a lot for some kids who are struggling, so. Okay, okay. so um, having raised those objections or just those pointing those things out for future reference, would you move to at least approve the current trips? Yes, I would. Uh, so move to approve. Do I need to do it separately or can I do you it? You can do them together. Okay, move to approve the JFK Middle School um, chorus trip to New York City and the NHS choral program trip to New York City. Okay. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and then I'll turn to uh, Ms. Boston ask you about the JFK eighth grade French trip. Okay, thank you. So my question related to all of these and it echoes what Ms. Fallon just said about the total cost and I just wanted to clarify because the total cost to New York each trip was on the order of $10,000 and I think maybe this is per person because 50 kids going to Montreal for three days, it says 640 and I just wanted to, <laughs> I, it's a much better deal than going to New York City. So I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> it's an exchange rate. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to guess it's per person, and that seems okay. I just figured that out as I was sitting here. But it just I, I was going to just try to figure out why these were so different. So is oh. that what it is, do we think? Yeah, yeah I believe that. Okay. That sounds about right. Thanks. So would you make a motion to approve? Sure, I, I'll make a motion to approve this. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Yes, do you have a question? I, I actually do. I just, I have an eighth grader, and I'm wondering if I should not vote on this. Um, Does that? It's just giving permission for children to children. leave the city, so I don't okay. think there's any, okay. I don't think there's any financial issue involved, so. Um, okay, so um, all those in favor of approving the Quebec City trip, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, so the, um, Field trips have all now been approved and the minutes have been postponed until the next meeting. We'll now move into the reports and recommendations section and we will turn to our student representative, Eleanor Harden, for the student representative report. So um, not much has changed since the last time we spoke about what we're um, you know, working on. It's still pretty new in the year and we've only had a few meetings, so we're um, still in the process of, of figuring out what exactly we're going to work on, but uh, we do know that we're going to continue working on, and we are continuing to work on the vaping issue, which I just talked about, and um, as well as the achievement gap issue. Um, so for vaping, like I said, we're mainly focusing on how we are going to help students you know, who have addictions, and we're reaching out to different resources in our community. And then for the achievement gap, we're reaching out to uh, REAL and the Students of Color Alliance uh, Club at our school. Um, members of that club are going to attend our next meeting and um, we're just more planning, I think for that issue, we're really focusing on getting as much information as we can to move forward. Um, I also just had a meeting with Mr. Provost about the, or Dr. Provost, sorry, um, about the issue and I'm planning on sharing that information at our next meeting, um, what we talked about, so. Uh, yeah, and then just some information about what's going on at the high school. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, the play is starting to have rehearsals and is kicking off. Uh, Booster Week is coming up in the next, in two weeks, which will be fun. Um, and then we also have a new literary magazine called Heartstrings that is going to um, go into publication on October 31st. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that report, Eleanor. Appreciate it. Um, now we'll move into um, uh, item B, uh, the capital improvement requests. Um, and these, of course, are the annual um, uh, capital improvement projects that all city departments, including the school departments, um, submit, are required to submit uh, to the um, city as part of the annually required uh, development of a capital improvement program, a five-year capital improvement program. Um, so I know that we have requests um, that are coming from uh, both um, 
school maintenance as well as IT, and there were copies of them in the packets. And I believe Mr. Pagan is here. I don't know if it's Tony. I'm Tony tonight. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Provost will be paying, playing the part of Tony this evening. <laughs> West Side Story, <laughs> but uh, um, so uh, so yes. Yeah, so there, there. I don't know if you want to give an overview. Each, uh, you were sent um, copies of the request forms that all departments are uh, required to submit. Um, so do you want to just give a quick overview of those, or sure. So um, we have. We have capital requests in three broad areas. One is facilities. That's the um, part that I'll be presenting on Tony's behalf. A lot of those um, requests you'll see have to do with the new executive order around um, reducing our carbon footprint um, as we operate our schools. Then we have um, a number of technology upgrades necessary in order to keep our infrastructure functional as um, we, um, as we, have larger quantities of data being transmitted second by second through our schools. And then the third have to do with um, the ongoing <coughs> placements of student transportation vehicles. And I'm going to grab that one if um, Mr. Well, Mr. Pagan presents, if that's okay, because that one seems to have disappeared from my packet. Okay, sure. Mr. Pagan, do you want to? So uh, we have three projects. Two of them are basically continuation of uh, multi-year projects, mm -hmm. and uh, one, one is new. The first one is the uh, switches update. Uh, we are basically replacing the switches throughout the whole uh, city network, and including the one at the schools. We, this is a three-year project, and we are on the third uh, and final uh, point of it. Um, this request is basically for the, for the last uh, few switches that have not been replaced. Uh, we are right now in the in the process of replacing the main switches at the schools. Um, some of them were replaced with uh, state funding. It was not capital funding. Well, actually, a bigger amount, like $170,000 of, um, of funding from the state was used for, for the rest on the school side. <clears throat> the Mr. the Pagan, system replacement we've been- Antonio, could you, yeah. I just, just for, lay people who may not understand because they hear switches and they think, oh, there's a switch over there on the wall. Could you just describe how what, the importance of switches to the networking of our of our sure. uh, data systems around the... So we have a fiber loop uh, that interconnects all the buildings in the city. We have about 169 uh, strands of fiber that works over through, uh, through all the buildings. And uh, we have two hubs meaning two points of concentration, one of the municipal building um, and fire station on the city side and one at the high school on the school side. In order for those uh, pairs of fiber to be functional, we need to put electronics. And that's what we call the core switches, are basically um, piece of equipment that are about $8,000 each. And, um, and I'm talking about one piece of equipment without all the modules that get into it. And electronics, which are um, transceivers, that are the ones that make the, the connection between, between servers. In order um, for our buildings to function with any kind of technology, doesn't matter what technology it is, we need to have enough bandwidth to, uh, to get that running. And uh, we provide not only the connectivity on the, on the uh, Bandwidth, but we provide uh, redundancy. So every time that we have a, a traffic from one building to another, we have at least two more ways to get to, to those two points. And that is because, you know, we have had in over the years, this fiber loop has been running for 10 years now. And over the years, we have had uh, car accidents that have broken uh, broke, uh, some, some fibers. We have a squitters uh, breaking uh, uh, fibers and Nobody has noticed any interruption because of the redundancy that we have. But that redundancy is expensive because we have to pay for the fiber and we have to fi pay for the um, extra equipment to do it. It's basically, I, I can get more technical, but that is- No, 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 I just wanted people to understand what the switches were. Okay. So the server system replacement, again, um, we, we have been modernizing the, the infrastructure at the schools and the, the, and the city. 
um, the city actually has um, done this be before the schools. Uh, previous years, we, we spent a great amount of money to modernize the, the server systems. And uh, two things that, that we gain with that is efficiency. So basically, we have uh, systems that last a little longer, but they are uh, much more um, responsive to manage and um, basically minimize the down the downtime. Uh, on the schools, it, it has been taking a little longer, uh, mostly because of funding structure and because of the the kind of equipment that we had in the past. And replacing is not is not simple to do. So we uh, this is the second year of a replacement. We are in the process right now to implement the new system that is going to replace with one system. We're going to replace about five servers that are in production right now. And um, the second part of, of the project is to create some redundancy on that system where we will be able to run some servers, not all of them, here at the GFK uh, location if something happens at the, at the high school. And finally, the directory service migration. This is something that most people don't know about, but we've been running uh, Nover, which is a directory service from the 90s and uh, we haven't been able to replace it at the school. I think that about two to three percent of the world networks are running on Nover and the rest are, are using Microsoft, so we are on, uh, on the minority side. The problem with having a system, even though it's a system that is up to date, they keep doing upgrades every year, uh, the problem is that we have less and less people with the expertise and when we try to integrate systems with our network, it's always problematic. And we all know what happened last year when we tried to put a very modern system for uh, controlling the printers, and it didn't work with Novell. And we were months and months uh, trying to resolve the problem because the um, support service people for, for the uh, new printer system couldn't understand how to work with Novell. And it was really painful to, to implement so, and we have that every time we, we try to integrate any system, um, which we are very behind on integration. Right now we work uh, staff in, uh, in the schools, they need to memorize about six or seven passwords, where in most cases, uh, when integration is available with one or two passwords, you can work on all the applications. So, but we are not able to implement things like that right now. So we need to, uh, uh, move forward to uh, implement this new system, which is in use in most places, but we don't have it. Questions? Are there questions about the three IT projects that have been submitted? Okay. Oh. I, have a, I just have a couple questions. Um, so just so I understand the bigger picture, I'm curious. The, I, I completely understand why you want to go to Active Directory. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious, is the money just to pay consultants, I would assume, to drag the stuff over, or it's not for hardware or anything? No, no, it's, 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 it's only consulting. Yeah. It's a lot of work to move it. And, and related to that, I was just wondering how we're thinking about when it gets moved, is it going to the servers that you're buying or is it going in the cloud? And I'll give you all my questions at once because this is really what I'm curious about. Um, where is it moving to and, and how are we thinking about that? Why is the, whatever the decision is, why was it made that way? And then long term, do we need as many servers or are we moving our stuff to the cloud? And the final question is, um, what kinds of stuff do we refuse to put on the cloud? What do we keep on the servers? And you know, what, what it, where are we now? What are the issues? And where are we going? Okay, very good question. So um, the, the vision for, for technology at the schools, similar to the city, is to uh, use the cloud as much as possible so that we don't depend on on-premise uh, hardware because it's always problematic to maintain. Um, there are, I, I think in the, in the school, the majority of the data is served is on the cloud, yeah. so we don't depend on on-premise for uh, for um, on-premise uh, for for data is served. Basically, all the systems that we use for data, we depend mostly for management of, uh, for example, wireless system needs uh, several servers to run. Yeah. So that's one area that could be on the cloud, but we just decided to do it on the uh, on premise uh, many years ago, and we are keeping it that way. It, it makes sense to keep it that way. 
um, managing of uh, uh, air conditioner, door controls, okay. um, cameras, all those kind of things we, we keep it uh, local. Um, we have file servers for administration. We don't rely on Google for uh, finances and, and other areas of administration. We use it uh, locally. The servers, um, well, let me go into one more direction. For Nover Directory Services, which is similar to Active Directory, it's just a different brand and a different way of dealing with it. Um, we use uh, basically um, servers that we host virtually. So we are going to replace those servers with another virtual server, but on Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft licensing is done on, on volume, so it's not going to increase the price of the license because it's basically just covered by the volume license for education, which is a, a very advantageous way of, of doing licensing. And uh, because we are using virtualized um, environment for servers, we are not buying more hardware to implement Active Directory. We just basically shut down two or three uh, Nobel servers, and we might uh, spin up two or three uh, Microsoft servers. So it's a it's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship there in terms of replacement, and it doesn't add to the load of the uh, virtualized uh, environment. It basically keeps pretty uh, uh, compatible. Okay, and I just do one sure. quick so. Um, all the other stuff is in the cloud. So, for example, student I, I, information system. Do we do we put it in the Google Cloud or do we put it in the Microsoft Cloud or both? And do we have some sort of protection? I mean, I guess maybe it would be more secure one or the other. I'm just wondering where all this other data goes if it's not on our servers. We uh, we depend on third-party uh, clouds. Uh, all our systems are hosted by all the companies, not by ours. And part of what the, the process that we do is, as we engage with these companies, is we ensure that the data priva privacy policies that they uh, use are compatible with our uh, data privacy. But do we pay, or is it like I'm just trying to understand moving forward? If we're getting rid of servers, do we pay for this cloud storage? Um, is it free? Is there a difference if it's free? Is it less secure? How do we think about that? We don't uh, currently we don't pay for any uh, cloud. Um, uh, storage. We are okay. not using any cloud storage at this point. Um, we are not planning to use uh, cloud storage. We we use basically software as a service. And software as a service, for example, Follett is a huge company that has a cloud. And they host their Aspen software in their cloud. It's a private cloud. And uh, we pay a license to use it. Okay. But we don't pay for storage. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Similar to Munis on the city side. Similar to Munis, Munis we is a private cloud. They they host our servers in uh, in their facilities. In we consider a, a cloud. They might consider something else, okay. but we consider a cloud in the sense. And, and we don't pay for storage. We pay for the licensing and the support. Okay. Thanks. I think so. Yeah, thanks. Um, other questions about the um, Mr. Pagan's uh, projects. Okay. Thank you so much. We'd all like our own private cloud. Um, uh, the, um, how about questions about the um, other facilities related? Um, well, I haven't presented those yet. Okay. Or the. Could I do the buses first? Please do. Okay. So there are two other sets of capital requests. First, directing your attention to the one prepared by Cami Lamica. This is basically transportation and point of sale. So. Two things I'd like to point out are changes in the capital um, requests. These bus replacements have been planned in the capital request for a long time, but our prior plan was to replace buses with buses. As you know, there's an extreme shortage of bus drivers at this time, and so we are changing that recommendation to replace our buses with vans. Um, because it's a much lower level of licensing and we have more success, we believe, in getting um, drivers. So it does reduce the number of students we can transport to a certain extent, but um, not having bus drivers drastically reduces the amount of students that we can transport. So that's a change. And then um, just the food service point of sale upgrade, this is something that happens periodically in order to keep our food service department compliant with the federal uh, school lunch program. 
So there are other items in the out years, including walk-in cooler for JFK and a bus replacement for a 30 passenger wheelchair bus, which at this point we think we will need to maintain as a bus, um, but that's not on the, on the plan for 21, it's on the plan for 22. Are there questions about those transportation related items? Response. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the buses. Um, if we have a shortage of bus drivers, um, what? Why would we want smaller buses? Because it seems or vans? Because it seems like if you could put more kids on a vehicle, you would need fewer drivers. So um, the routes that our drivers are, are running are really specialized transportation within the city. Um, and there, that's one type of transportation they do. The other type of transportation they do are roads that are not easily navigated by large buses. So um, going to a larger bus would not necessarily serve our needs in that way. Yes. Uh, other question, and I'm sorry we haven't had a budget um, and property subcommittee meeting, and I think this is probably more appropriate to go into depth there, but you can, you know, tell me what you think. Um, but since we are here and we can bring it up, I have been really interested in um, talking to people about moving forward with electric buses and potentially these vans, and I don't want us to lose sight of that. Um, what's incredibly exciting is there's some big grants out there right now. The VW settlement for when they cheated on emissions um, and we've just missed the first round unfortunately um, last week but there's a second round coming and I would really like to encourage us to be in a position to apply for this my understanding is right now in the first round they'll pay 80 percent of the electric vehicle and 80 percent of the electric vehicle is a lot more than hundred percent of one of these and we have excess solar um, I believe, um, during the day, certain times of year that could be used to charge these vehicles. And I, I know there's been pilot programs, there's been problems with them, a lot of the problems have been solved. So I just want to encourage us as a group to think forward, part of what Northampton's trying to do to become more, um, use less fossil fuels, this would fit right in. And I, I think these grants are going to go quickly and I don't want us to miss the boat on them. So I just want to make sure we keep track of that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I just Sorry. was curious, what's the difference between um, how many kiddos can be on these vans versus a bus? So I am somewhat punting on this answer, but um, most vans, I believe, are about 8 to 10. These are wheelchair vans, so it would be less than that if they were transporting a student with a wheelchair. Um, the wheelchair buses are 30, 30 yeah. passengers, so it's a... It's a significant reduction from the bus to a van. Other questions about this set of things? Okay, next. So next, I will go to the Central Services capital requests, and I would uh, ask you to, to look for the one that was uh, mailed later in the day rather than the one that came out originally with your packet, because um, there were some late additions to it. Um, so you should be looking at one that ends with um, district offices space use design and upgrades. So on your sheet, on your sheet, uh, instead of going uh, just chronologically or in order down the page, I would like to try to present them thematically. So if you can go to the second high on your high priority on your list, you'll see a number of facility assessments. Um, this is really the first in a long project, which are all related to compliance with the executive order around trying to reduce our um, emissions from schools. So the first high priority is $60,000 for um, greenhouse gas emissions um, assessment at Bridge, Leeds, and Jackson Street School. And then you'll see in 2022, there's a second um, $60,000 for assessments at the other schools. Um, these other items that you see in the out years following on that are related to energy are in anticipation of what we think some of the 
deficiencies will be identified or some of another way of putting it is opportunities to become more energy efficient, more carbon neutral. Um, so uh, you see that Ryan Road, Jack Leeds, Jackson Street School um, all have uh, energy management system upgrades and out years. Those are to implement what we think the findings will be of the assessments that are being done in the first years. Um, so also the Leeds uh, boiler replacement, the Bridge Street boiler replacement, um, the strategy being followed in all of these to go along with um, something that I know is a very strong priority of the school committee is when there's a need to replace something, using it as an opportunity to replace it with something that is more energy efficient and more environmentally friendly. Um, so those are um, all those energy related ones. There are two here that are sort of happening outside of the project um, and those are the JFK energy management system upgrades. Um, these are really phase two and phase three of a Johnson Controls update that we're doing on the energy system in order to um, really just keep the energy system functioning at its current level of efficiency. Um, one of the things, there, there are really two main players in the HVAC system for large municipal buildings. One is Johnson Controls, the other is automatic, Automated Logic, and both of them have replacement cycles that basically have you more or less continuously replacing um, components of your heating system. So that's those ones. Um, also, there is a study this year on high school track resurfacing. Um, high school track is reaching the end of its predict predicted lifespan. Um, so the study is just to uh, assess the current status of the track and what are the best options for resurfacing. You'll see in 2023 is the year we're projecting that that project would need to move forward. Um, next come some big projects. Um, the next building that's going to need a roof is JFK. And you can see that right now we have that projected as a two-part project um, in 23 and 24. Both of those would have to be MSBA projects, so there would be reimbursement involved, but um, would be an extremely costly um, capital project, so we need to begin planning for that. Um, the JFK window repairs is not an efficiency repair. Um, this is just to repair some problems with our current windows. Um, there are many windows that have um, lifting mechanisms that are now, now um, either non-functional or barely functional and so just replacing those so the windows function properly. That's what those costs are. Um, and then the leads, the leads flooring replacement, this is part of a general um, updating scheduled for leads. There are um, we would be replacing some of the older tiles, which are tiles that um, include asbestos and are part of our abatement plan with uh, newer tiles that do not include um, asbestos. We do have two tests going on right now. We replaced a classroom at uh, Ryan Road and we replaced a classroom at the high school this past year with a new um, non-asbestos containing material. And so we're um, seeing how that, how that material holds up that probably is the material that we're going to go with at Leeds. That's what the, these um, two amounts are. Um, wouldn't necessarily be the same exact color or the same exact design as what we have at the high school or at um, Ryan Road because there are literally thousands of colors and shapes and different options that are available within this material. But um, that's what we project we would be doing the replacement of the flooring at Leeds with. Um, and so then next, um, JFK paving, um, again, that's not for this year, but again, just ongoing updating of the blacktop for parking. Um, the next one, which is high, is um, window replacement at Leeds. Those are energy-related projects. I um, think that those also would likely be something that we would attempt to get MSBA funding for, especially the $250,000 project. The um, walk-in freezer at the middle school is an energy-related project. This is a new type of uh, control that is um, 
has been shown to reduce the electrical usage of the freezer at um, big walk-in freezers. It has something to do with the way that air is recycled within the freezer when the um, when the door is open, so that there's less of a energy loss. And then, um, so you see, we have more flooring upgrades. Again, that's more of the same, replacing the old the old material with the newer material. And then, um, an accessibility up upgrade for the nurses room. This is to, at, at Ryan Road School, this is to provide um, access for students who uh, use wheelchairs and require hoyer lifting but also are ready to begin um, begin using the bathroom. And so they need a specialized place where this can happen. Um, we did have $150,000 that was uh, approved in prior year for general um, bathroom upgrades at Ryan Road School. So this is really a request to add about $75,000 to that original uh, request, which is, hasn't been spent yet, and to direct that funding to um, refurbishing the nurse's restroom in order to um, provide for the students' needs. The other uh, benefit of doing this this upgrade at Ryan Road is it would provide an all-gender bathroom that um, Ryan Road is the only school I believe right now where students requesting an all gender bathroom still use the nurses space. So even though this is adjacent to the nurses space, this wouldn't be the same thing as going to the nurse to use the restroom. And then the last is um, design and upgrades for um, office space. This is the superintendent's office. We've had um, additions through the years, um, mainly in the area of curriculum. And curriculum, as I think you know from our last um, meeting, is a very bustling, um, bustling office within the office. It has um, been created some noise um, distractions, which have impaired the production of minutes and impaired um, some of the other functioning of folks who work within the office. We did have Roy Brown come in and do um, some design. So basically what it would be is closing off um, office spaces, providing um, more soundproofing in office spaces for um, the workers within the superintendent's office. Um, and then one I did skip, which I just, uh, was a mistake I want to go back to, is the um, fire curtain at the high school. This has been something that we've been talking about replacing for a while. Um, obviously, we will would still be talking about replacing this for a while if this is approved because this is for FY23. Um, but if you have spent time on the stage and get up close to the curtain, you can see that it's really showing its age and it needs to be replaced. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's a very costly curtain. It's a $50,000 curtain. Um, so that's why this is a capital request. And those are the facilities capital requests. Are there any questions about the facilities uh, requests? Yes, Ms. Hans Ms. Pusansky. Um So on the JFK roof replacement, which you know looks like a, a really large uh, chunk of money, when you say we would get reimbursement, do you have any, or we might get, or be able to do it through MSBA? Right. What do you know what that might look like? How much of a they so, might cover and or any sense of it? So every project is rated on its own um, economics at the time. I think the last two projects, or three projects that we did, had reimbursement rate, I want to say, around 56%. Okay. So we'd still be responsible for that other. It still leaves almost $1.5 million. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Kopp. Right, thank you very much, Dr. Provost. That was um, very helpful to find out all these things. One of the things that you and I spoke about, and you might not know this, but just as a reminder, was there any discussion or update on making the gardens um, accessible? Yes, there was. Um, that is not on this capital list because I believe Central Services has some funds that they can use to, um, to put towards that. But I did have a conversation with Mr. Kuzniers about it earlier this week. Okay, so you're sounding optimistic? I am cautiously optimistic, yes. Okay. The other, there's another piece of that project, actually, which is also um, to install a wheelchair accessible um, swing. So um, we would hope to try to do both of those things. Would, would this be at one school or at school? That would be at Ryan Road. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, could you, um, there's a, I, uh, thank you first off for presenting this. Second, I really appreciate the um, 
steps that we're taking to, you know, as we as we all say, to move our city in the um, toward greener energy. And I was just reading, for example, how important freezers and refrigeration is hugely important, much more important than any of us actually take into account. It turns out. Um, would you talk to us a little bit about the the? Um, I, I think it's the the HVAC systems too, like the management. Mm -hmm. um, System upgrades there. How controls the controls? How we hope that that might uh, support better heating and so um, and which schools might need it more? Or, you know, so there there are two different components of this. One was just the controllers, which is the JFK management system upgrades. Those are upgrades that I don't see as having a significant impact on our energy efficiency, other than um, sort of the pollution avoidance of letting our system become um, out of date. Right. Um, so these are just maintaining the controllers. Uh, so the thing with Johnson controls, in my experience, is that the components are built with a limited lifespan, and um, so when you have any kind of a large heating system, there's a certain number of controllers that need to be replaced basically every year. And so this is the cost of maintaining those. It's not really the cost of installing something that's going to be new and, and create a performance improvement for us. However, if we didn't do it, then the system would, its efficiency would degrade and we would be um, burning more fossil fuels. The other types of um, uh, upgrades that you see here, like um, the Ryan Road energy management system upgrade, the Leeds uh, energy management upgrade, the Jackson Street energy management upgrades, we are anticipating those as implementing the recommendations that come out of this assessment that's planned in year one. So I can't tell you what those would be. These are really placeholder numbers, but our expectation is that those would be real um, changes to systems that could create better efficiency. Same, likewise, um, when you see the boiler replacement for Bridge Street School in Leeds, um, we believe we'll be replacing with newer boiler technology, with more efficient boiler technology. Um, <coughs> I think that there's always going to have to be a boiler of some extent because every building has a hot water need. Um, but I also can envision a future where 100% um, of the healing, heating might not be through boilers. Some of it might be through mini splits or other types of technology. Um, we really won't know that until we find out what happens in our assessment, if this okay. is approved. Okay. So the assessment will help us lead to more green technology in our schools? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, Mayor Narkowitz, I'm wondering if it's my understanding that the approval process here, where the money resides and how it gets approved and whether it gets approved is far different than our school budget process. So I was wondering, either before or after we vote on this for the public, can you give like a one or two minute overview on what the steps would be to, to uh, for us to acquire the funding to do this? Sure. So um, the... Uh the, all of the city departments and the two school districts, um, both Smith Vocational and NPS, um, submit their um, submit their requests. And um, I have a I every year appoint a um, a screening committee of sorts, a capital improvement committee that um, helps go through all of those various projects. Um, they actually interview department heads, um, mm -hmm. and it's a combination of. Um, I do have a representative of the school committee on that. I have a representative of the city council. Um, I also have people um, who are uh, from the community. Uh, so I have some community members who have expertise, uh, particularly in, in this sort of capital management. And um, basically what they do is help us try to prioritize what are like the highest priority, you know, medium priority, long-term priority, um, and, um, and make recommendations to me about those uh, and again this is a process that has to happen every year sure. so we're constantly updating the five-year uh, program um, we then um, are required to um, come up with a five-year program that um, shows what we believe are our top priori our, our priorities and we also have to be able to identify potential funding sources so we can't say you know we want to build the superconducting super collider and it'll cost $10 trillion. And, you know, but we actually have to be able to say, like, and this is how we would actually pay for it. Um, 
So that in itself is just like a planning document. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a requirement, again, of the charter. I think the idea is that, you know, we want to always be taking care of our infrastructure and taking care of our capital and always you know, planning ahead um, for replacement. Um, so then that goes to the, um, the plan, the program itself goes to the city council. Um, they usually have a public hearing on it, review it, um, and then they um, vote to either approve or disapprove of the program. Um, it doesn't actually commit any funds, it doesn't commit any borrowing authority, it doesn't commit any appropriation authority. Um, and then um, separately from that, uh, um, typically after the program has been approved, um, then we bring forward, um, I will recommend a series of council orders um, either for, um, uh, you know, um, using funds from our capital stabilization funds, using um, our free cash that gets certified every year, and in some cases for larger projects like the roof projects, um, borrowing authority. Mm -hmm. So for the large, those $1.5 million you know, uh, roof projects, um, I'll be asking for borrowing authority. And then those go through the typical uh, financial process that the council has to approve any borrowing or appropriation. So that's sort of the process. No, we thank you, yeah. So right now we're, um, at, if, if this gets approved by us, then it would, go to, it would then go to the city council? Uh, it would actually first go to the capital improvement process. Yeah, okay. it wouldn't go directly to the city council. Yeah, um, it would go through the capital improvement program process, um, and again, you know, the DPW is submitting these sheets and other departments are, and then we're trying to um, assess them, sort them in some cases, fit them into a five-year cycle, um, you know, understanding like what our what our debt capacity is, what, what debt is being paid off on a project and yeah. freeing up debt capacity. So we're trying to figure out, okay, you know, you wanted it in year 2022, but we can't actually, we don't think we can actually fit it in there, so we're gonna have to push it off, or we're gonna divide this into two. So there's a further refinement that happens. Yeah, I'd say. Um, and then um, the, the total program gets gets published, there's a there's a review period and a hearing, and then, then we move into, okay, now we wanna actually bring forward orders to actually fund them. So you're actually, what's happening here is you're sort of giving the, the superintendent the approvals to submit these projects. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So there's a number of steps after. Yeah. And I think in the past, um, uh, yeah. So I think this is just trying to make sure that the school committee is aware of the projects that are being submitted. Right. I appreciate um, that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as a rep, I am the representative of the school committee on the capital improvement. So if you have any questions, I could maybe help answer those. But I think what I would like to share is that um, there are department heads from throughout the city that come and we screen those and listen to the needs. Um, and there is millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of requests every year. And the amount of money that actually ends up being identified through the mayor's office that can be put towards the projects is substantially smaller than the requests every year. Uh, so with that said, when, when the requests come from the school department, um, it's important that the ones that are most important are rated the highest. And so as you're looking at your, um, at your information in front of you, um, the ones that have high next to them are the ones that we as a committee will look at and try to, um, to the best of our ability, or myself in particular, will advocate strongly for those in the current year. In this case, it would be FY 2021. Um, and things that really catch the attention, I can tell you, of the committee are things that we call um, uh, like essentials. So like anything that is like life safety, for example. So when the fire department or the police department come or there's something that's occurring in our school department in regards to um, security measures around uh, school entry points and things like that, that usually catches the attention of the committee. Um, things like roofs and boilers, there's an understanding on the committee that those types of things are essential to the overall health and well-being, not only of the building and its preservation, but the people that use them and, and are sheltered by them. So um, 
those are the types of things that the committee looks at and tries to honor it, um, when the requests come up. But um, as I said before, with so many requests and, and so much need, that things that are labeled as medium or pushed out to out years, um, sometimes those just keep getting pushed out and pushed out. And um, so I just encourage the school department, as, as I can see they have done, to really prioritize them using the high, medium, and low uh, as, a, as a kind of a understanding for the folks that will be kind of going through these to understand that they are, um, they are high needs items um, at this time. Um, saying that, I respectfully ask that you really do take the climate, the changes that, that we can do to our schools to support uh, lessening our effect on the climate as a high prior. I mean, it, everything here is of, in that nature sure. is, but it becomes suddenly, um, you know, as important as safety or, sure. you know, all uh, of yeah. that. So, I, I mean, I try to cover everything. I, I'd also say that's a really important um, yeah. Uh, item as well. There's been so much work done in the city to try yeah. to um, work towards that goal. Um, and so, yeah, for sure, anytime efficiencies can be had, those are looked at really important projects as well. Uh, not just energy efficiencies, but efficiencies that will help sustain our planet, our planet. as a, yes. as a place <laughs> of, of living. So, yeah. yeah thanks. Ms. Fallon. Um, can you just explain to me if we know that we're going to need to have the track resurfaced for two hundred thousand dollars in the next few years? Why we would spend fifteen thousand dollars on a study in advance of that? Uh, I can't because I'm not an expert at it. Um, I do know that frequently, whenever there's any kind of a large um, capital project, there is a study phase before you actually begin the work. Um, sometimes you discover problems that you don't know that you had. Um, sometimes you discover opportunities that you might not know about if you don't do some work looking around before you actually begin the project. The other thing I would say is th that um, for a public construction project of that size, um, th typically that study would also produce the bid drawings or the bid documents. Okay. That would be, I think, part of the process that you need to actually okay. bid the project. Um, that's typically, you know, when you do a large construction over $100,000, you typically have to have a first, you have to hire first a designer or an architect to actually pr produce the bid drawing. So it's a highly specialized, um, probably, process. So I'm assuming. I mean, it's a round track. Like, I'm just saying, I can barely draw, but if it were a building, I'd get it, but yeah. it's a track. I get it, but in terms of the composition and the structure and the, you know, Drain whatever. Drain it. Okay. Right, Whenever the There's underlayment fields right here. next to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I just. Certainly just, I can speak to that because it's come up before and um, that's exactly right. I mean, it is a round track and you would think well, that, uh, or yeah, yeah. oval. <laughs> you, you would think that that part of the design well, is pretty straight away, straightforward, so. but there have been drainage issues in areas of sag within the, um, within you know, the overall structure of the track. And so I think that would really want to be looked at, especially putting that type of money into it to make sure that if there's anything that can be done in order to maybe stop that from happening the next time, that that would be in the plan before it had been. Thanks. So. I figured there was an explanation. Sure. And then, Mr. Moore. I, come, I think it's my annual comment on this, which is <laughs> that parking lots, um, I always think are rated too high just because hopefully people are driving at low speeds <coughs> in the parking lots. And so the concern about the condition of the surface for me is much lower than if it was a street that people are going at higher speeds on. And um, so that's the first one is that I think they, <laughs> that I really think it's okay if parking lot surface aren't in perfect condition. And then the second one is um, twofold. Just asphalt itself is a tremendous greenhouse gas producer. I think the highway resurfacing in this country is one of those things like 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions from, from roads because um, of all the solvents in asphalt. Um, so, so considering the surface of the material both from that point of view but also from a, just looking at the construction of it in terms of uh, stormwater management because parking lots are another really huge source of stormwater and stress on the 
on the flooding situation in the city. So I think basically parking lots are much more complicated than, <laughs> sort of like tracks, much more complicated in terms of their impacts. And um, so both to do them right, I think, costs more. To not do them at all costs a lot less and is maybe something you can live with. <laughs> um, so basically to consider the parking lots maybe more than we might because they seem like such a innocuous thing. So. I just have a couple of comments on that. I've sat on the Capital Improvements Committee for a number of years and listened to the DPW come forward and explain the reasoning that these projects become so expensive over time and how if we could really tackle them right when they become <laughs> problematic, then it would be actually cheaper, although it's tremendously expensive then as well. Yeah. Because as the underlayment and the rest of the kind of support system below it gets eroded as well, you just can't patch right. over it because it's even worse. And that's, and that's where, again, you know, then it's a matter for me of looking at it. The next question question is, is do we want to redesign our parking lots sure. um, for having to do with stormwater management? In other words, do we, if, if, if we're going to, again, take the opportunity to do something with the parking lot, maybe we want to do more than just simply maintain it at, as, yeah. you know, in its well, 1960s quality. Sure. Uh, I mean, no more, and have different, better materials in terms of, you know, management. The, these paving projects within the parking lots of schools have been kind of kicked down the road a little yeah. bit too and they've been put off and we've looked for opportunities to roll them into bigger projects so that if you know there's a street being done in town if we can grab on the end of one of those projects to do it then right. it's been the way that the cities try to tackle them uh, but yeah definitely I hear what you're saying okay all right thank you thank you both other um, comments about those so I think the request um, from the superintendent was just to have a vote that you've reviewed these requests and that the committee is okay with uh, the school department submitting these uh, requests to the capital improvement process. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes. Thank you. Next, we have a vote. Um, for a transfer from the out of district to personnel account, and I believe uh, Pam Plummer is here. Speak to that. Speak to that. Thank you. Um, I'm actually pretty darn hopeful tonight being able to present this to you. Um, it's an example of um, when problem solving needs to happen pretty quickly to support students. That um, dovetails really nicely with conversations that are already happening at a school about uh, things that people are looking at, about alternative programming. Um, I am always really careful when I present information about transfers from out of district tuition lines to um, positions within the district to be thoughtful about the privacy of students because actually while it's a large amount of money, it is a very small number of students that I'm actually, um, where the, the, the funds are being uh, relocated from. Um, in this particular case, we have a few students who um, have, act have pretty actively advocated with me to start thinking differently just about how their education looks. Um, some of their out-of-district placements have um, not been the right match for them, and uh, some of them have experienced the feeling that they've sort of reached the end of their road with um, continuing to be placed in private day placements like they've been placed in. Um, and some of them are close to graduation, some of them are not. Um, and so we're really trying to figure out how to help them, one, not drop out, and two, develop some programming that will not just support these students, but also support some other students, um, hopefully uh, before we uh, would lose them to out of district placements be, by being able to provide the services in district. So um, the first, we have some tuition funds that are available um, for students who've stopped attending. Um, just to give you a quick example, um, we have had um, students who have really struggled with their placement but who have continued to attend while we're brainstorming uh, who are super clear that they don't want to keep going but until we figure out what to do next we are maintaining their placements to the tune of going to school two days for an entire month um, and paying a tuition of $6,500 for that month for a student to have attended two days. So that's the type of money we're talking about and the, the part that's exciting to me is that the students are so willing to have really active conversations about what 
what would be meaningful them to, for them to engage in, and how that matches up with the amazing um, brainstorming that we've done with folks at that high school. I'm really glad to have Ms. Melvezi and Mr. Messing here tonight. Um, we've had some really great conversations and we're feeling pretty positive that the proposal we're putting forward would be very, very helpful for our students that are currently at Northampton High, as well as the students who um, are returning in some way or other uh, to access these services. So one of the things is a lot of the students when they're out of these out, at these out of district placements, while the overall model might not be working very well for them, largely because of the social challenges in being in a placement with lots of kids with challenges like theirs and the social dynamics of that and how that spills into social media. Um, it's just, it's, it's a hard dynamic to manage for some of our students. One of the things that tends to go well at those schools though is access to pretty quick clinical support. If they're having a hard day, they need a chance to regroup, go back to class. Um, our current, uh, the two adjustment counselors at the high school who are working with our students right now, between the two of them have over 80 students uh, with IEPs, which is a lot, especially when you consider that by the time you're at the high school level, really your opportunities for grouping students, there certainly are opportunities for grouping students for some counseling activities, but largely a lot of the students are really ready to spend that 30 minutes a week having pretty private, intense, individualized conversation with their counselor. So it's not like you can just have a group of five and a group of four. Um, our counselors spend a lot of time doing really good work with our students, but they are not available to at, sort of at a moment's notice if a student just needs somebody to talk with really quickly. Or if they ought, do make themselves available, it's at the expense of cutting short something that was possibly really important to try to not cut short. Um, so that was one area where we feel like it would be really important um, to increase um, a position at the high school, an adjustment counselor position. The next one is exciting because it dovetails with our Twilight Academy program that we have a couple of students engaged in right now who are participating in um, gaining credits in order to um, graduate but aren't necessarily interested in participating during the school day with everybody, all the other student population there. The piece that um, that I have students who are willing to, who are hoping to um, start accessing this type of support, the piece that's missing is we don't have a licensed special educator attached to that program. So we're really hoping that if we attached a licensed special educator to that program, um, a half-time person who could come in towards the end of the day and stay after school, students who are in this, either in an in-between phase um, in programming or those who were coming up with some creative solutions, including a combination of internships, work study, um, online coursework, um, and tutoring, there's a special education teacher available. We're thinking it will be a pretty small number of students um, to start with. And one of the key things that the people, those, um, that person would be responsible for is monitoring any online coursework that's happening and helping determine if additional tutoring is necessary, how students are progressing, and really kind of case managing um, along with other folks at the high school. But it, it's, it's, um, it's hard to keep up with because it's different. It's just different than what, um, what we're, we tend to do day to day in our four block day. Um, and then the last one um, has been just a real challenge. We have a couple of students who participate in programming in our 18 to 22 range that required like a day a week of, su of support or even um, a two hour period a week of support. And we have been struggling every week to find somebody to fill these very short blocks of time positions to the, to the point where it's really affecting the students. Um, we have exhausted our sub line. We have contacted so many different people to try to figure out somebody available at this particular time. At the same time, we've started recognizing that the needs are spread out enough that we're mo much more likely to be able to support the students those short periods a day, including periods a week, including um, the one um, like the one day a week, the Thursday that we need. If we were to have somebody, a paraprofessional full time, that sort of is is filling the need of those students in transitional services, um, without having to take them from someplace else, um, we just haven't even been able to do that using subs. So, to have somebody who's connected to our transition um, program in that way would be really helpful. The other piece that recently happened is we had the PVTA come in and train 
I think it was almost a dozen people, right, to become trainers in the PVTA because there's such a wait list at the PVTA for travel training that they made a number of our um, faculty and staff travel trainers at the high school. And so this person would also be really heavily involved in travel training um, with our transition related students. So that's a lot. <laughs> okay. So the so just to summarize though, to to try to address all of those issues, you're seeking this transfer yes. from the out of district account yes. to bring it in district to hire this person to provide these supports yep. that students need. Yep, an adjustment counselor, a paraprofessional, and a half time special education teacher. Okay. Are there questions, uh, Mr. Coffin? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Plummer. That was very helpful. Are you, so do you have a big picture in mind that in the future we'll have these positions? Right now they're funded by specific kids that are coming back to the district, but do you have a big picture in mind that students in the future might make, might, and their families might make a decision to come back to Northampton schools as a result of the additional resources we have? Yeah, 100%. And I think if you've, it's painful to sit through some of these program uh, meetings with students who, you know, you've exhausted your resources and yeah. what are we going to do and we don't want you to drop out and wow you're this close to finishing and um, it's really really hard and I've had conversations with some of our private day placements too about how so what happens when we have a student that we're paying seventy thousand dollars a year but they're missing 65 days of school that's we can't continue something's not working in that particular situation and I, I wish I could say it was few and far between but it is not um, so I think by allowing more non-traditional ways of accessing both content you know a curricular content that is going to allow students to progress and get their diploma and have successful careers or go mm -hmm. to college like we, we've got to be able to do that at the same time while we're providing an emotionally supportive environment for the students to actually be able to do that Right. Um, so it's, I, I really believe, I could even imagine that other local districts will start sending students yeah. to us, honestly. Good. I really appreciate your attitude on this and your thoughtfulness of it, and it really sounds like a win-win, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. I, I agree with what Mr. Kaufman said in terms of just the thoughtfulness and what it can do, but I also have a concern, and it's, it's not to say in any way that I'm against this it's just a concern because we heard from parents in elementary schools this morning if uh, earlier this evening and um, and I've heard from other ones over the past week or two and I'm really concerned about the needs of implementing the wins model across all four elementary schools as a school committee member sitting here I don't have a clear picture of what those needs are for the younger kids, but I do sense it's a lot of kids, and there's a lot of kids that need maybe another special ed teacher available at, at a certain grade at a certain school. And I guess I'm sitting here wishing we had more money, because I want to do all these things, and I don't even know if this money that's coming back in um, from out of district placements, maybe there's some more that could be used for those other needs, maybe there's not. but. As I sit here, I, I, I wonder if we could get more information of the needs of the entire district in terms of all the kids that are struggling at different age groups with different things and then somehow prioritize where the, like kind of what we did with the capital improvements, where is the very highest priority. Um, and that doesn't take away from anything from this amazing proposal and the thoughtfulness, but I know that we don't have enough money to do everything we need to do and I feel I need more information about the other needs in this area too. Right, so what I... Dr. Provost just wanted to... So, um, so as, as Dr. Plummer explained this, this really has to happen as a package because you need the supports at the high school in order to be able to bring the students to the high school. So I think this... Um, this transfer has to be sort of considered as a system within itself. However, um, I will just mention to the committee that we became aware, and I should say that this is a strategy that we have used, I would say, just about every year we've been here. Um, I think much of the new program that we've been able, much of the new program we've been able to fund has been based on taking students from um, out of district placement um, back to the district. So just, um, 
A few hours ago, we became aware of another opportunity that may allow us to do something similar at um, the elementary school we were hearing from earlier this evening. It's a little bit, um, a little bit early to, to get into detail about that, but I think that um, we may be able to do something to address some of those concerns that we heard earlier tonight with a different transfer. Yeah, which would come at a later date, but mm -hmm. I do think that's an important factor. Yeah, in this particular case, really, the very uh, small number of students that we're looking to support, it's actually like a pretty even amount of transfer when you consider the, the three positions and the um, some of the additional tutoring that we're um, doing right now to support the students while we're trying to figure out um, these placements. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, really the alternative for them is there is no real alternative. I mean, um, it's to provide another private day placement because that's what we've said we do and we have a school for you to go to regardless of if you're getting on that van any every day that also costs us mm -hmm. $20,000, you know, for the year that keeps showing up every morning despite the student not getting on. Um, so it's really, um, yeah, for them it's either, it's that in, or dropping out at this point, so. Do you have any follow-up? Go ahead, I, I think I do, but go ahead. I'm just curious how much money we're talking about. Did I miss? So we can estimate, I think we tend to do estimates. Um, we often use like 55, 50 to 55 for a unit A position, mm -hmm. or 20 or for a paraprofessional position. And then, you know, 20 to 25 for a half time special ed teaching position. And so, will this equal out with the take, bringing them back from the out of? It's pretty close. It's yeah. Pretty and close. like I said, we're also doing tutoring too. So, and mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the unknown at this mm -hmm. point about the tutoring. Um, so, and there are also some other moving parts at the high school. Um, so, some of these students' stories are kind of complicated. And, um, I would say that I, there's probably about 20,000 left to between tutoring and figuring out if we might need to use some of those funds for something else that we haven't quite figured out yet for these particular students. I'm, oh, I would ahead. just add to that by saying, but it's really hard to say when um, Dr. Plummer says it's pretty close, that's about as good as we can do because <laughs> this is a calculation so that changes every day. Yeah. Every day there's another day of tuition. Yeah. Um, so that figure changes as farther we get along and also we don't know who will be hiring for the position so we don't know the salary so that's another big unknown yeah. but using sort of our ballpark figures for this the math works yeah. mm -hmm. and I know in some cases we've actually saved money in bringing students back and so but that's not your sense with I think it'll be pretty save money by being able to provide services for students who if we didn't have this we'd then be having to send them to out of district placements um, yeah that's okay. the big savings. There could be some savings. Uh, it's unclear. And, you know, just yesterday I learned of another student who may want to drop out. So, in theory, that's another $70,000. However, I still have to go to these team meetings and advocate for what's right. And what's right could be a wide variety of things. It might not necessarily mean adding another position to the high school because this student will um, access the same type of programming. It's just really, I, every day I go to work, I'm like, whoa, okay, let's figure this one out. Like, but this feels really safe. This, mm -hmm. this proposal feels like it's a safe plan. It's a plan that we know could benefit a lot of kids at the high school. And also, I, we, have, um, we have an understanding and a willingness from the students who are coming back to engage in this model that doesn't exist really around any other form of programming right now so and then just a small question I don't know what a PVTA travel trainer is sure it's to help students access the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority buses independently training them how you look up bus routes how you find out where the bus routes are there's actually a whole other component for accessibility that some of our students will be able to call and schedule a van pickup because of their dis their um, status as having a disability um, it's really an important factor for some of our kids to get a, get around the valley. We're lucky to have a, a bus mm -hmm. system like that, so it's great. great. But there's a huge wait list, so. So, so I think I just need a clarification because after listening to 
Dr. Provo. So when I read this, I thought these students are already at Northampton High School and we're looking for ways to better support them, but it sounds like maybe this is um, a, mix of a mix and we need this in order to support ones that might come. Or and that are coming with the, this, right? Yeah, okay. So that I didn't fully appreciate. Got a kids on. Um, I mean, really, it's really just with this hat on of I know we're not doing enough for a whole range. It's it's not that I don't want to support what this little group needs, but just to ask you, um, are there going to and and Dr. Provost, I'm probably asking you this too. Are there ways that we can assure with our limited budget over the next few months that we can support? the WINS model in the way that we need to, and I'm not in the elementary school classrooms, I don't know what that means. I don't know what kinds of support we need. Um, how worried are we about finding money for that? And if we are, which I suspect we are, is there a way to, should we be scaling this down just a little to make sure that we spread our money around? Or is this, you know, the minimum of what these high school students need. I don't know how to judge if this is, you know, the Royals Royce or the really minimum. It's the minimum. Okay. But it's the minimum they think is reasonable. Yeah. And actually could have a pretty significant impact. Um, because, you know, it, even the, the, like I said, some of those tuitions are in the 70,000, 80,000. It's a lot of money. Um, the alternative is a, is a lot of money. Um, and or the students dropping out, which I'm also not really, it's just, I, that can't happen. So I have to find some way to support these students. And this is an expensive way, but it was more expensive the way that what prior. Yeah. Can I say something? Ms. Malvesi. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, go please. Ahead. No, please go ahead. <laughs> just welcome you to the podium. Malvesi, I'm an associate <laughs> principal at the high school and um, and I feel uh, like I'm in a, almost in an impossible situation tonight. I also have a son in the second grade at Leeds Elementary. And um, I would guess that he is one of the students who was earlier described as being two or three students, um, which is also hard to hear and hard to say, but I think that is probably the case. Um, and I feel like I he has a great team, and I think the people at Leeds are doing the very best that they can. Could everybody use more resources? Yes, um, I think it's probably a matter of how the resources are being used. Um, and that's, uh, you know, at the high school we struggle with the same thing. Um, but I have to say that at the high school level, we were actually a day late and a dollar short of having the money. We've already um, taken in a few of the students from out-of-district placements without the, the supports in place. Um, and, you know, when we talk about caseloads, we already have really high uh, caseloads for our adjustment counselors. What they can't manage um, is seeping into the guidance counselors, which is, and it's just a trickle-down um, effect that, you know, that has a, a large impact on the overall uh, success of the students. And, um, you know, we want to have students come back to the high school. Uh, we welcome them, but we really can't um, service them and the other students that we have. And so I think looking at different alternatives um, is a benefit to all of our students. Um, but the reality is, is that the students who already are in the high school who have recently joined us um, are, are taking up an inordinate, inordinate amount of time um, from our service providers our counselors, and um, it's not sustainable. That's it. So. Oh, I was just going to make a motion to um, to transfer from the auto district to personnel accounts. Second. So just to get the motion on the table, okay. Uh, any other questions or discussions about that? Um, so it sounds like, Dr. Provost, you may be coming at our next meeting. So, might get, <laughs> yeah. On the other situation that we were discussing. About. So, um, since you're directing that to me, I guess I, I would just uh, also like to answer your question by saying, so there you heard two schools, one 
right. implementing a WINS model, one's implementing a completely different model. What we're really dealing with is what I've been calling the high needs future. Um, when I present the MCAS scores in a couple of weeks, you'll see that all of our peer districts have changed, all of our peer schools have changed, and that has to do with the change of our student population. And the school right now that's um, experiencing the quickest change in, in the student population is Leeds. So I think that is one of the things that's um, driving it. But it's everywhere. The, mm -hmm. the, the population at the high school is changing. Um, kids are um, presenting us with more difficult needs. I will say this to the teachers, to the administrators, to everybody. Um, ESPs, they're doing tremendous work meeting those needs, but um, every year I bring a budget and it's always a matter of trying to pull funds from this place and this place and this place to build the best thing I can for that moment and then it changes. Um, there was a tremendous amount of um, population change over the summer in the district. Um, students ended up um, at different places than we thought they were going to be. Um, one of the pressures that, um, the, that Leeds is dealing with right now has to do with um, some students who are displaced by um, disasters in other communities. Um, so that is all kind of hard to um, project in a budget, um, but that's why a budget is a guess and why the work has to always be ongoing of trying to make um, shifts and adjustments as you go to um, meet the needs that present which may be different than the needs that you anticipated when you were building the budget. So there may be, so you may be coming forward to us with some updates on that. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right. So there's been a motion um, made and seconded to approve these uh, transfers from out of district to personnel account. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. It, it passes. Thank you. Next, we have a vote, um, a requested vote, to accept some donated um, IMAX from Smith College. Um, and Ms. McLaughlin is here to speak about those. Yeah, hi. Uh, Smith has been overly generous uh, with us over the years in donating equipment that they um, feel would benefit our schools. And one of the areas that they have often been um, helpful with is supplying that, the Mac uh, computers that we have access to in our schools. And they offered to donate uh, some additional ones. And so I'm here asking that we accept that donation. Those are things that we use, uh, again, as we continue to educate our students in a variety of different platforms. Um, that is one. Make a motion to accept the donation of Smith College IMAX. Second. Any discussion? Free computers. Um, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, and Ms. McLaughlin, please stay there because you have the next item on the agenda, which is the approval of a job description for the IT Pathways Coordinator. It's actually an, it's an IT, it's taking uh, this idea of at the um, high school taking the idea of having this IT pathway that we have had in, uh, in process as, al along with the idea of implementing and incorporating this internship work studies career focus uh, piece and putting it all under one umbrella and so uh, the way it currently is designed is there's a, there's a position that covers a, a lot of the career readiness training and a lot of the internship coordination and all of the stuff that goes into that work studies and whatnot at the schools and then we had the IT pathway coordinator position and what uh, this position is is basically taking those two and having it so there's one solid person that uh, is the point person for all of that work that's happening at the high school uh, and so one of the things that this would offer and allow us to do is it would take what is already um, as we've seen over time or you may not notice that but I notice on my spreadsheet the numbers of students doing the IT pathways as well as just the increased number of students doing internships at the high school uh, it gives them a point person it gives them the opportunity to also have that person la uh, be present over the summer which is huge for the innovation pathway program because a lot of the primary um, internship experiences happen over the summer as well and it allows that person also to utilize that time to continue fostering relationships with other business and community members to continue allowing our students the opportunity to have those experiences. So, um, I, I'm, how would you make a motion to just Oh yeah, yeah, I make a motion to put the description on the floor. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Um there is, I don't know if this is for you, 
at the high school, students can do work study and internships that are not in the IT correct. pathway. And there is somebody who helps coordinate that. So just to, to clarify what Molly said at the beginning, um, we had a half-time position in the IT pathway right. that we needed to fill. Right. That the half-time internship coordinator from the high school applied for. And so we, the, there's obviously a um, overlap in skills needed for the two positions. So this um, idea is just to combine the half-time coordinator at the high school with the half-time coordinator from the IT pathway. Okay, so my follow-up then is that this person is still facilitating work studies and internships in other fields that all the students want to do, not necessarily IT. Yes, that's the other half of the position. That's the other, right? Okay. Yes. And just to clarify, we've already funded both of these half-time positions, so would it be true to say by bringing them together, if anything, we save a little money? Or, I mean, well, potentially, we don't need benefits? Right, potentially there'd be a benefit savings. There'd be a benefit savings. So it's not costing us anything and potentially it's saving us something. Is that okay? My other, just the same pitch I made, I think with the other job description for the transition coordinator position. Um, you know, it, it seems to me likewise that there's a certain amount of overlap in terms of the, you know, the, the outreach to various sort of opportunities within the community for both transition coordinator position and for this position, and I just I don't, I don't think it has to be in the job description, but encourage um, encourage those two people to work together. Yeah. I, so while you're here, I, I am curious. So somebody has been doing the internship program coordinator, and they applied for the innovation pathway. Is that really a fifty percent job, the internship program coordinator, or is this? Or is it bigger than that? They are overlapping. So um, the way the way that the internship or the IT pathway coordination hours were allocated is a higher number than right now the work and internship hours are allocated. Does that answer that for you? Um, I guess what I was wanting to make sure was that we're not going to lose out on a fifty. If, if the person doing the internship program coordination is doing more work than a 50% time, I don't want to, I think it's following up on what Ms. Burnham was saying. We don't want to lose um, work that's already happening. I'm assuming sure. that it's. Sure, part of the reason that we look to combine these is because yeah. there's a lot of overlap in building relationships. Even right now, um, the internship coordinator has been able to make connections with companies in IT, but also in other areas. And it's this idea of, you know, we were at a meeting today um, where one of our students from the Innovation Pathway was speaking to a lot of uh, leaders in the community. Um, and Secretary Pizer said, hey, you know what, we would love to have that. He would like as a vision to have 50% of our students in some form of an internship or a pathway. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Provost, if you remember his timeline. Um, but that's his goal. And so the idea being is this person who is currently doing the work that is building these rapport, uh, th this rapport and relationships with companies, right. whether it be specifically in IT, but also understanding the way that this idea of exposure to careers, work-based learning, <laughs> readiness, and all of that, it, it goes both for IT students as in the IT pathway, but it also goes for other students. So the partnerships and the relationship and the skills really inevitably are to go out to all students. And so there's an overlap in that, that skill set. And I think as um, you had referenced, is having like multiple, multiple people makes it more and more complicated. Um, or not necessarily complicated, but if there's similar work, communicating and working together makes great sense. And so in this position, it's saying, taking this person who, yes, does a lot of coordination for the IT pathway, but also joins in with this other, I think it's more or less saying it's just going to offer and open up more opportunities than um, restrict. And, and I think ideally, I like the idea of combining them if, though, for the reasons we've said, but I just want to put out there, it's important to make sure that it doesn't turn into all innovation pathway, right? That we maintain some, um, commitment to a broader range of internships because yeah, that sure. don't involve technology at all and you just wouldn't want to combine them and make 
So well, there's a couple of things I would say. That also, that's where I'm. We're also extending that individual's time. So by allowing that work over the summer, that also gives that. And you know, while I am a representative of IT. Um, you know, my background is in many different things, and I do feel passionately about the idea of saying, you know, I sat with a student the other day who was advocating um, to look into some different careers. Um, even within the pathway, one of my students looked at <coughs> different careers, and the idea is not is not for me to say you need to go into IT because I went into IT. The idea is to say, hey, here's an opportunity to see what's out there. And so really this position, it's it, it, the intent is not to have it be solely one track, like, oh, aren't I lucky? I have a you know full-time only IT. The idea is really to have a point person for students to go to. With right now, because we have this particular pathway, yes, there's a lens in getting that underway. But because we see those skills as often you know overlapping, the intent is not to have it be solely this is only the person you go to for IT, which I think is what you're saying is your concern and I'm saying it's important and we as 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 both the administrative um, staff at the high school as well as I think the entire um, group that's been working really hard at the high school to get these experiences um, available to students, the intent is to continue allowing that to happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I ask one more question? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, there is talk of other pathways. So does that expand sort of? So uh, I have said in many different settings that I'd like to see another pathway at the high school. If obviously we are able to be successful with that, we would need to staff up for that. Okay. Um, but I think at this point, um, the position is appropriate to cover the IT pathway and the internships we're doing. I could say there's another way this could grow as well, which is we've also had conversations about our 18 to 22 year old population yeah. needing more um, workplace yeah. learning opportunities. So that could cause it to grow as well. Sorry, I want to clarify one thing. Um, is, are either of these current 50% positions grant funded or are they in our budget? Where does the funding come from both of the, these? The, portion of this position that's paid for from the IT pathway is partially grant funded and partially funded from the appropriation. And how about the internship program? That's completely from the appropriation. Okay. Okay. So uh, we've had a motion made and seconded to approve this uh, new uh, job description. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. Next, we have a request um, from the superintendent uh, seeking a vote authorizing him to negotiate a MOU for a math interventionist chair. Dr. Provost. So this may seem familiar to you because last year um, NACE had requested an, a that we use the funding that was in the budget for the PE the high school PE chair to fund a reading chair for the elementary school. Um, as they presented the, the um, proposal, they said, no one's taking this position, it's in the budget, and we do have reading specialists working at the elementary school trying to provide interventions. It would be helpful if they attended the, the chair meetings so that um, they, could, they could coordinate their efforts with their um, classroom teachers and others. Uh, last year you allowed that to happen and um, we did use the money that was in the budget for the PE chair to fund the reading specialist. And when the contract was renegotiated, we embedded the reading chair in the, in the contract and it's part of the budget. So the PE position is still unfilled and the NACE has asked me, what about a math chair? Um, we have math interventionists as well. Um, they don't have a chair position um, and so I think to be consistent with my former position that if it's in the budget and um, we want to have a chair but the chair is is not coming forward in PE we could use the money for an educative purpose by uh, approving the use of it for a math chair so that would be that would be my request Ms. Fallon. Can I just ask, so if you were to do that though and then at some point you decided you wanted it to be used, there wasn't just to be used, it would, would still be? I would propose a one-year um, non-renewing agreement much as we did with the oh. reading chair. Okay. 
how much is the money? The chair position, I think, is somewhere, somewhere around $2,300. Sorry. No. Um, I just want to ask you again. It's, should we be careful right now and maybe consider postponing spending money on new things in light of what I think is some pretty big need at the elementary schools? Uh, we could defer this till next month. As I said, there might be more information forthcoming next month if you want to keep this on the table to possibly use for that. I don't think that would be a problem. We just have to be mindful that we have collective bargaining agreement that says we're going to pay this $2,300. So we can for, for, a for, for a PE chair. So, right. so if a PE chair yeah. was to apply, then I think we'd have to use the money we'd for have, that so position. We'd have to come up with it. Um, so I just want to be mindful we don't just say we're going to reallocate that $2,300. We're saying we're going to do it for one year at their request, but we still have to, we still have a signed contract that says we have to pay that $2,300. And it is at their request. It is. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. Can I move to put this on the table? You can put it on the table, sure. <laughs> I would just make a motion in favor. I make a motion in favor of it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, so, so your question. Can I offer an amendment to sure. postpone it till we get more information on the needs at the elementary schools? Okay. That's an amendment. Uh, well, it's, I would just say you just you'd want to make a motion to postpone consideration of this, which would then override the okay. the motion. Okay. Sure, I'll make a okay. motion to postpone. Okay. So that needs a second. Is there a second to postpone consideration? Okay. Lacking a second, um, it comes back to the main motion and the second. Um, all those in favor of. Um, Authorizing the superintendent to negotiate this MOU, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? I'm going to abstain. Okay. Um, next, we have a report from Dr. Provost on his feedback that he collected at the open houses manning the late start table. That's correct. <laughs> Last spring, we began discussing a late start model in which all start and end times would shift 30 minutes later in the day. Thinking that this would have the greatest in potential negative consequences for elementary parents, I reached out to the elementary school councils to assist with um, communication to the elementary parents and gathering opinion. This resulted in a survey showing parent support outweighing opposition at the elementary level by about two to one. When I presented the information, you asked me to attend the fall open houses to try to speak to the 33% who were opposed to find out more about the reasons for their opposition. So tonight, I have to report that my mission was only partially accomplished. I did table at all four elementary schools and the middle schools, but I can't say that I learned much about the third of parents who may be opposed to the plan because most of the people I spoke to were actually very supportive of the plan. Um, I had 42 individual conversations over the course of five evenings. 38 of those conversations were elementary parents who supported the change. Of the four who were opposed, uh, three were parents who felt the later start would interfere with their work schedules. One of these suggested a better option would be to flip the middle and high school tiers and make no change to the elementary start time. The fourth individual I spoke to, who was in opposition, was an eighth grader who was looking forward to getting out of the high school at two o'clock and doesn't want to have to stay later in the day. Um, so many of those who supported the plan, I should note, asked why we didn't just switch the elementary and the high school tiers. Um, and with all of them, I shared my opinion that that is actually more consistent with the research and would probably be a better option, except for the fact that when it was studied in the past, we learned that many of our families depend upon older children to watch their younger siblings. So that's why that was considered an unacceptable option in the past. Um, once I explained this, um, everyone who asked the question was supportive of moving the, everyone back by 30 minutes. Um, there were some interesting comments. Some parents pointed out that they would need to pay more for before school care, but would save an equal amount in after school care so it would wash out for them. Others pointed out that it would be a difficult adjustment no matter what, 
but they still felt they supported it because their children would benefit when they reached high school. Um, one parent made the strange, or I shouldn't say strange, one parent made the unique comment that um, having a, a longer before school activity would actually provide a better value for their child care dollar because they felt like the why before school child care was kind of a rip off at this point because they're really only watching the kids for about 15 minutes and so getting a solid 45 minutes might actually be a better value. Um, so there were trade-offs involved for parents who were in support and um, the parents who came to speak to me at the open houses, I think, felt that the trade-offs were acceptable and, and worthwhile. I would point out that one of the people that I spoke to about sort of this split with the majority being in favor of the change and uh, a minority being in opposition to the change felt that it was very similar to the splits that had come in all the rest of the um, late start plans. Um, so I think it gets back to the original question that, um, that was posed when I first began on this adventure. Uh, is there a group that we're willing to disappoint in order to uh, obtain a late start? Although I would say that we're not there yet. Um, as Ms. Ballancourt pointed out, when she last spoke to the school committee on the issue, we have yet to hear from the students. I would also add to that that we have yet to hear from the employees. Um, the leadership of NACE we have heard from, who has said that this definitely would have to be a subject of negotiations um, if it was to move forward, so put that out there. Um, so uh, I guess I'm here to get some more direction from you and to advise that if you'd like me to continue this exploration, I think the next steps should be to get some input from other stakeholder groups, specifically uh, high school students who this is all being done um, in support of and um, who we have heard from some students who said maybe they don't want this to happen. We also learned um, last year that knowing the high school start time is very important for students planning to take Smith College courses. So um, the decision doesn't need to be made immediately, but it should be made soon enough to allow for the necessary planning for next year. So that's, that's really what I got out of the open houses, and I guess I'm just looking for your direction now on how you'd like me to proceed. Eleanor, you seem to perk up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Having to wake up at six thirty is always something that we <laughs> high schoolers would look forward to. I think. Um, I think generally, it's it's at least throughout my high school career and me being in this district, later start times have been kind of a hot topic, I guess. And um, I'm interested to hear that you're actually thinking about a plan um, to, to change that. So um, at least from what I've heard and what I've experienced, I'm, I'm sure I think the majority of students would be uh, in support of, of changing the start times. Although you do make a good point about Smith College classes and how it kind of lines up really well right now with um, our classes and their classes. Um, and I think another concern is um, after school sports and, and having to um, stay either like really late in the day um, to, to do those if we did end up moving the school start time back. Um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the main concerns for most students is just is the, or two of the main concerns would be the Smith College classes and, and sports, especially for students who don't have time to go home in between um, the school day and the sports that they play after school. Um, you know, sometimes some practices just because of like space availability or you know coach availability, they don't start until 6 p.m. Um, or, or later. And for students to have to wait from you know 2:30 to 6 to, uh, for for those um, sports practices, I think may be a long time. So yeah, those are, I think. Really what do you think the best way to poll the student body will be? Just I mean. Is that survey? The student, the, student, <laughs> yeah. the student union could do. Or yeah, something? I think the student union would be uh, very willing to survey the students if that's something that you think would be helpful. Yeah. 
that's what the committee wants. I'm, I'm asking the committee if they want me to yeah. keep going. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so just to add to that, I think years ago, it was actually hard to poll the students, and there was all sorts of stories of double ballots and all this, but now you all are very good at doing this <laughs> online, right? Yeah. And we've seen all sorts of polls that the student union has done over the last few years, and I would heavily support hearing, you know, how the students would vote on that if, if other people go along with that. I, I personally think that's really important. And um, Dr. Provost, I thought we were going to ask the school councils to weigh in, and you know, especially at the high school, I don't know if that's a method you want to use or not. I'm, I'm more interested in what the students say through the poll, but I am also interested in what the teachers have to say. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, just a couple things. I think for teachers planning, they need to know early enough too, because a lot of them have child care responsibilities that probably have to get committed to before Smith College classes have to get committed mm -hmm. to. And the final thing with the Smith College classes, mm -hmm. the schedules change dramatically this year, and there's there's a lot of different start and finish times, and it, I think it is working well with the current high school schedule. But what is the new block called? I don't remember the jargon. Flex, Flex block. Flex block. Um, once you know what time the high school is going to start, mm -hmm. and if somebody looks, and I'm happy to assist, at the Smith College, very complicated new schedule, um, and you, if you are willing to put that flex block in in a way to accommodate that start time and the flex block, because it's going to change with the flex block right. anyway, I think you can probably figure it out. Mm -hmm. yes. On the flex block, is that going to be put in place next year? Is that definitive? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, one of the things that I feel um, I would really appreciate in any kind of um, survey or presentation are all of the factors that affect people because we anecdotally talk about who has a job and who takes classes at Smith and I feel like when we make these choices, you know, the, the we're weighing things um, out, and I would really like to know what are the groups that we are weighing, who is taking a burden of this, like, who, I mean, I, we know that there's, okay, we know that educationally it's stronger for students, like, okay, but we know that there are also all of these reasons that it hasn't happened. So, what I hear you saying is that you're proposing a two-level survey. One is, are you in favor of a half an hour later start time? If so, why? What are the reasons? And are you opposed? If so, why? What are the reasons? Or even, or even, what are some things that you think about that would make this difficult for students? I mean, I think that students also want to take care of one another and that they would just, you know, they also are taking, gathering information. I mean, I feel like it's that collecting, it's a whole bunch of data points that I don't, I can anecdotally imagine things but that's not research. So your, you know, I also feel like the principals and the alt team and the teachers know a lot of this and the students know a lot of, you know, and to pull together so that we just have a list of like, what are the risks, what are the things that people are, are um, how can we acknowledge the things that people are letting go of to make this happen? Maybe. Do you have more comment? Uh, I think so. so just to clarify, I should the the survey would include, you know, what would you be sacrificing? Are there any issues that would, you know, come up, come with this change? Right. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Busanski. I think it's great if the student union did a survey. I really support that and we've gotten a lot of really great information from past surveys and I think that the student union has worked with maybe different teachers, maybe the statistics teacher, et cetera, on how to actually yeah. develop a survey that's not biased. I understand right. your point, I recognize it, but I think asking the question, what are you sacrificing or what would be difficult right. would right. really bias all the results. <laughs> and it's more that I just want to I know. understand what you're trying to I'm not to saying that at. that needs to be in the, Mm -hmm. I don't, sorry, I'm interrupting you, I apologize. But I, I understand your point, I, I, rec I mean, I, I think it's a good point you're making, I just don't think that's the way you'd want to go about it right. in, right. you know, developing a survey. Lots of kids might not feel like they're, or might not be sacrificing anything. So um, I, I think that's, and that's part of why we're talking about pushing all three schools uh, levels a half an hour so that kids who do have to pick up younger siblings aren't going to be 
our families won't be sacrificing that. anyway. So there's right. it, there's there is a little bit of that already embedded in how we've done that. So I would just really um, urge you to you know try and come up with a you know as much of an unbiased survey as you can, so we can get at the real information that we want to get at. Do I understand you? Okay. So thank you for that report, and uh, and you'll keep us posted. Well, I don't actually know okay. if you want me to keep going or not. Yes, you want? yes. <laughs> yes. keep going. Okay. All right. Keep going. I will keep I am, you posted. Can I ask one more question? <laughs> I, so I am curious because Dr. Voss had uh, put out an idea. I didn't know if we were going to look at it at all or not about not changing the start time, I guess, at the, I can't, you could probably say it better, Dr. Voss, but um, not changing it at the middle and high school with that, or changing the middle and high school so that they're both start at the same time. Um, just briefly, the idea is to leave the middle school and the elementary schools as they are and to see if the high school will fit in the middle. And um, we have a meeting on the books with um, the busing coordinator to understand that better, and it's next week. Okay, so we'll have more information on that as well. We're sort of pushing ahead on that as well. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so do you feel? I do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, excellent. So next we have a report from uh, Ms. Fallon. This is the required report that has, needs to be happening from the Collaborative for Educational Services. Thanks. Um, so you all should have received the um, executive director's report from um, Bill Deal of 14 pages. Um, and what that largely requires is that I just report from the meeting. And so rather than go over what you've already read, I just wanted to share with you something that uh, we did discuss in depth at the meeting, at our last meeting, and that I thought was really interesting and in the conversation that's like continue with the committee. Um, I don't know if all of you have read um, Commissioner um, Jeff Riley's Our Way Forward. It's the, his report that he released in late June, um, kind of summarizing his findings after his first year on the job. Um, and I, it was great that we were, I feel like it was the first time I was, we were part of the whole process. I know a lot of us were there when he first came on the job and met us at the Delaney House and sort of mm -hmm. held that stakeholders listening session. And then um, many of us, uh, I know Dr. Provost and I were both able to attend his conference um, at UMass, um, kind of re it was the, setting the blueprint for the 21st century and kind of reimagining what education in Massachusetts would look like. Um, and he's, you know, been to a lot of. It. He came and visited our school, and um, has been to talk with the MASC. And so, at the end of all that, he came out with this report and um, really identified the direction. It's available on the DESE website, and I won't go into depth about it. But he essentially identified the key points in this kaleidoscope collective learning program pilot uh, that he's going to be starting um, this year um, to focus on deeper learning. Um, but a lot of the items that he sort of highlighted as um, being most important um, for this, you know, this coming um, century, I thought was really interesting, were things that, in large part due to the leadership of Dr. Provost, and like you just heard um, uh, Molly McLaughlin talking about the IT pathways, that we're actually already doing a lot of this in our district, which I think is great. A lot of what he highlights in his report are things like um, early college programs, dual enrollment, um, the innovation pathways, home visit programs, internships. Um, we're really kind of ahead of the game with paradigm shifts. And so all of these community partnerships, like the one we have with the Five College Consortium, um, and the paradigm shift and working with the collaborative for educational services are really important. Um, and that's exactly the direction that they hope to see us going. Um, but the conversation that also happened within the collaborative was how can they best support us and where do we see those needs arising? And I feel like, you know, that's the conversation we haven't had as a community and it's gonna be time to sit down and talk about the new district improvement plan. And so I would love it if we could make time at some point, um, you know, in the new year to, to read this report and sort of talk about um, how are we preparing students for the 21st century? You know, there are jobs that we should be preparing them for that actually don't even exist yet. There's there are changes in the curriculum that are probably going to be suggested. I know there's a big push for um, 
you know, pushing more towards um, analytical um, and applied mathematics and statistics and probability versus the old standards of geometry and trigonometry and um, a focus on more uh, learning to learn um, and s other skills. So I, yeah. I think that I, these are conversations that they're interesting and I think that they're important for us to have when we think about what's coming down the path and the direction that it's clear that the new commissioner wants to take us. Um, and I'd rather be part of the, um, part of leading this than, than reacting to mandates as they're handed down after decisions have already been made. Um, so anyway, that was my report. I would love to talk about it with anybody. It's available on the um, DESE website and um, we don't meet again until mid-November. Thank you very much for that report. Any questions yeah. about the collaborative? Yes, Ms. Busanski. So um, I think it'd be a great idea to put it on a future agenda for us to all read and discuss. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, or I didn't know what format, uh, whether it would be a retreat. It retreat. could be a retreat. Yeah, I feel like as a retreat, maybe as part of goal yeah. setting or, you yeah, know, yeah. it's trying to, when we think about the future, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of have in mind where, what direction the state leadership is actually hoping yeah. we go. I think that'd be great. Year, some retreat materials so that could be one yeah okay um, yes oh, sorry. Just a comment real quick first of all thank you Ms. Fallon for sharing this and so I'm looking on page five and then um, one of the gentlemen who works for CES it says has continued the facilitation of district level strategic planning in the Belcher town and Amherst regional schools this work embraces a multi-year multi-year plan including outcomes objectives initiatives and action plans and I just wanted to if you if you weren't aware of this, Dr. Provost, or if you haven't, I don't know where you are yet with thinking about updating our district improvement plan, but it looks like CES offers somebody at least. I know there's a number of people, but that would be one op opportunity I would just encourage you to consider. Sure. You have some feedback, obviously, from our two neighboring districts on how well that has done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, so do you want to now continue with the next item on the agenda, Ms. Fallon, which is the MASC resolutions? Sure. So, um, as our voting delegate, right? Um, as yeah. So I, there are nine resolutions. I know you've all read them um, this year, and I think last year too. A rationale is provided, which is really helpful. As you know, there's no way of knowing how these will be amended on the floor. So I think that the fastest and maybe best way of going about this is to just ask if there are any strong objections that you have to any of these that I should know about, or if there, if you have any very strong feelings about something that I need to, you know, fight particularly hard for. I'm assuming that most of you are in generally supporting um, the resolution. Um, but I would certainly take any uh, direction that you have to offer. And I would like to add that I was able to add, so the last resolution on charter school reform, um, as a member of the resolutions committee, when I got there, there were no resolutions that had been submitted. So I was able to submit that. I reworked one that had been submitted in 2015 to bring it up to date, and then was able to vote on it at the July board of directors meeting. Um, when I stood in for the chair. So that did make it in there. Uh, I don't know that it'll do any good, but I'd like to keep it in front of the legislature as a priority. Mm -hmm. So are there any um, any of these resolutions that anyone has a concern or wants to pull out or are we generally supportive of them? Did you have, were there any that you have concerns about that you, you think we should be Mindful of? I, I had questions, um, I, and that I did ask about the uh, licensure, the continuing to educate their diversity and professional professional licensure. That I checked with Dr. Provost, and I did ask a few teachers about, and they assured me that um, it really had the MTEL had been identified as a barrier uh, towards attracting a diverse workforce and um, for people coming in from other states. Mm -hmm. And I guess they offered in me a different way of thinking about it in that they weren't saying to get rid of licensure, they were saying there are alternative licensure processes that could exist that would be less burdensome um, and and difficult for um, equity of access and opportunity. And so, yeah, so I certainly support it now that I've gotten some clarification on it. Okay. And I had a question about the bus transportation one, you know, which would, I, how would that, does anybody know how that would work if we were to, um, would it be, 
would it be using PBTA buses or would it be PBTA operating yellow buses? If, if this... It's, it's the, yeah, so it would be using the PBTA buses. That's what that's what the regional transportation right, is kind that's of what, initially that's what talking came out about as that, allowing, right? As opposed to just allowing them to be the bidder and them being the operator of Yellow Bus. You see what I'm saying? I think that their intention was the there was the federal tripper legislation mm -hmm. that prohibited yellow school buses from being in competition, competition right. with the regional transportation. Oh no, sorry, it was the opposite. It was the, the yellow school buses being competed with. Right. Um, were protected by it, and so I think that their hope was to eliminate that, that legislation and allow them to mm -hmm. use regional transportation that was already in existence mm -hmm. and alter their routes, because that was another thing, wasn't it? Yeah, that they weren't allowed to alter their routes. Um, okay. And it was Busansky. Oh, sorry, you're done. No, I think he's done. Okay. I just thought it was interesting that we had in our budget um, a line item for including menstrual products at the high school, and then we had we took it out, and here we have resolution number eight, which is a, for access to menstrual supplies. And I just think it's interesting that we're going to be again ahead, ahead of the curve. curve. I know, and and that we're going to you know either we, either we will do it first <laughs> or they will make us do it, but one way or another we're on the same page. So it was sort of interesting to see that as yeah. one of the resolutions. So, sounds like you're hearing that everyone's, there's no burning objections to any of them, so we'll go forth and cast our vote for us. Okay. <laughs> and again, thank you, Laura. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank we, you for <laughs> your trust in me. Um, that's coming up next, when is it? Uh, November. November, okay. The first, right after, yeah, okay, early November. The Thursday. Yep. I think it's usually Cape Cod. Um, okay, next we'll turn to Ms. Fallon for the report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, and I know you, you have, there's one vote, I think, on that list tonight, and it's just, it's actually just a vote to refer a policy to the Rules and Policy Committee. Yeah, so, so last month we had asked you to refer the question of um, the SRO having access to student data to us, and now having met and discussed it at length, we realized that we would actually like you to refer the policy that would pertain to that issue to us so that we can um, bring that back to you. So we're asking for you to refer policy KLG relations with police authorities to us for review. Um, is that a motion? Yeah. Okay, is it, and it's been seconded. Um, so again, the, there's been a motion made to uh, basically forward a policy to the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, um, moving on to the first readings. Yes, we have a group of policies that are first readings. Um, we had talked about going through a little bit more systematically um, through the policies. Uh, and so the first group of policies are from Section A, um, and they required minimal changes. Um, policy AA, school district legal status, um, just to kind of go through it. I hope you all have the highlighted yellow parts this time. Yes. Thank so you. I did compare, we did compare um, our our uh, policy with the MASC policy. Um, we realized that we were missing uh, the words children who in our uh, version and so we're asking to add those in um, and we are changing the wording slightly up the last paragraph to read the Northampton Public Schools are the president of the city of Northampton. Um, and those are the only changes that we will be recommending during the second reading next month. Um, can I go on? Yes, please. Okay, policy A, B, um, the people in their school district uh, is identical to the MASC policy. It was last updated in 2003, so I thought it was important that we all at least lay eyes on it as we go through this. Um, and so we will be bringing that forward with no suggested changes. Um, policy ACA, um, non-discrimination on the basis of sex, was actually um, revised in August of 2015, so more recently than a lot of our policies. Um, once again, it is identical to the MASC recommended policy and we are not recommending any changes. Um, possibly. 
at this time. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry, where are we? A E. Where is my A C B. A E. A C B. A C B. Oh. If I'm going down there, order, oh, I'm right? sorry. A -E. Sorry, A E is the next one on okay. the agenda. Okay. to yes. accomplishment. Um, is identical to the MASC policy, uh, was last revised or adopted in 2003, so we thought it was important to review it, and we will be bringing that forth for a second reading next month. So no um, changes. So no changes. Um, and then finally, so policy ACB is actually non-discrimination on the basis of transgender and gender non-conforming status. Um, it is a policy that the... Um, MASC does not, in fact, have. Uh, they um, just have their non-discrimination policy. Um, but I think kind of like what Mr. Sansky was saying earlier, like, I think this is an area in which we're leading. And I know that Mr. Moore and I attended a conference, a seminar, a conference, professional development thing uh, last weekend in Springfield that talked about um, LGBTQ students. and. You know, this was something that came up with um, in that discussion, and I think that, in fact, a lot more districts will be moving towards having a policy such as this, and that I think it is important for us to spell this out in policy. Um, because it's such a new policy for us, it was, um, gosh, updated, and we wrote it just two years ago. Yeah, just created it two years ago, and I know Karen Jarvis Vance spent a lot of time mm -hmm. on it. Um, we are only recommending one small change um, on the third page. It's highlighted in yellow that the responsibility for the district for oh, for what it it's we not did, perfect. What did we change it to? Oh. I didn't make a good note here. Yeah. Responsibility for basically was determining the district yeah, of a student's it. preferred gender. We 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 changed. It from, uh, one small change on it. It was, yeah, it's determining that we didn't. Yeah, yeah. It was the problem oh, was that, that it really is the individuals, they are the one who determines their identity. Yeah. Um, no one else. District, yeah. And so it really is about, um, you know, we, we, we struggle with the actual word. I think it was about whether it would be for um, claiming or asserting or, you know, being, making sure that. that they are addressed by oh, appropriate the programs. Responsibility for yeah. notifying the district yeah. okay, of so students' missing preferred word. Yeah, missing okay. word. Yeah. Okay. The responsibility for notifying the district of a student's preferred gender identity rests with the student and or the parent guardian in the case of young students. Um, we realize upon reading it that determining was problematic. Um, so that'll be the only recommended change, and we hope that despite the fact that the MASC does not have this policy, that we will in fact vote to maintain this. Um, so that's it for first readings. Um, for yeah. yeah. So just I, maybe I'm a little confused. So the ones, there was a few here from 2003 that you said MASC has not updated. Mm -hmm. So does that, so has your team looked it over and decided that it, no yeah. updates are necessary or that's your next step? That first four that she just went through? Yeah. Yeah. The ones that we didn't propose any changes. We looked at them and proposed no change. So next time, but you're uh, certainly welcome. No, 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 I was just wondering the process. So you looked at them, you, you're not, and so has MASC um, updated all their policies? So they are constantly updating policies in the same way that we are. Yeah. Um, one of the things that they did, and I was just pulling it up now to uh, show you what to look at, was um, when they when they redid their. Um, online reference manual, they removed the dates. And so when I, like right now, I just pulled up their online policy manual, and so I don't know when the last time they updated theirs anymore. Yeah. So we track when we last looked at it, and that's why I think it's important for us to actually can go through systematically and read through our policies and to compare. Um, so the only way I know it, when they've updated it is when they send out, they'll send out those notifications saying we have addressed these policies and they'll say like please look at it. It's like a legislative update or bulletin or a policy newsletter that they send out. 
So let's say we look at uh, AE, commitment to accomplishment, as an example. Mm -hmm. So you would go to MASC, you would open that up. So I'm C. opening it up, there's no date. There's no date, but the language is the same. It's identical. As, the, as this one that yes. we're looking at. In fact, we we had a good discussion about that policy. <laughs> I mean, it was just some of the language we had is so saying, well, we don't we really have any proposed to change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but that doesn't mean. Yeah, and so I think part of our point in doing this is, I mean, we have so many policies. Yeah. I think it's important to even if we spend five minutes going through to just at least lay eyes on them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, to compare. If they're the same, if if the committee feels strongly about changing some of them, uh, that's certainly right. something we could do. But I think that we should at least be, you know, laying eyes on. No, I, all I totally policies. agree. I just think like we have counted on MASC's leadership on this. Mm -hmm. This this and the others you mentioned might be an example where they just haven't gotten to it. We right. don't know. We have, so they might update it in six months. Exactly. And we'll go. Oh, I wish we would have had this rather than. Well, and then we can go back and we do it. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. I just had a comment. Um, when I, I wasn't part of the committee when the um, transgender and gender nonconforming status was written, but it's really well written and I read it and I just want to thank you all who did it. I think it's such a model and I don't know if this is normal, but I wonder if you want to submit it to MASC as saying, you know, we put this policy together, we're really proud of it. Um, maybe you want to consider adopting it and sharing it with other districts. I don't know if they do that, but it's really good. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, we probably should share it with the presenter who's working, Dr. Dodge, who's working with other districts on creating this policy. So yeah. We should probably save him a little trouble. I would check with Dr. Uh, with uh, Karen yes. Jarvis Vance first. I would just note that I have shared this uh, policy with several colleagues who are looking for a model. So I know that other districts are looking for something. Yeah. She will be missed. Yeah. Yes, yeah. she will. We can still call her up, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. Um. Okay, so uh, on to the so second. Now, so now we're on to the three policies from that still remain from our section D. We're so close to down with section D. Only three more to go. Um, so we have these are second reading and votes. First, we have policy DFH fundraising events. Um, that one. Sorry, so many pages. Yeah. That one um, we had brought forth with no. Yeah, I don't even have it here. Changes. I think Whatever. it just came late. But if someone would make a motion, I have an amendment. <laughs> I don't know how it missed. Uh, motion to approve policy DFH. Second. Okay. And I'm just realizing I don't know why this version doesn't have it, but I could have sworn that um, we made fundraising one word. Did we not? Yes, yeah. it is on this one. Okay, yeah. it's not on the version that I. There are I some changes. Uh, we have some changes. See, I don't have that on the version that I. Got. Yeah, I don't have that on my version. Fundraising is two words, and I actually. Have another Can we get a new that version that of this do. in our packet, or? Yeah, I have the old version. Yeah, yeah, one sixty old version. version. Okay. Where did you get your version? From Dr. Provost. Where did you get your version? From me? Can I see that? Yes, please. <laughs> you, please. You should use that as your uh, motion yeah, making. Another policy. That'd be great. Sorry, I didn't oh. see that. Okay. It's the old one. Gotcha. <sighs> Okay, so yeah, so I have the newer version. I'm so sorry, I don't know what happened with this. But um, so I would move to amend the policy to have all instances of fundraising be one word instead of two. Second. Well, can, do we vote on that amendment first? I have well, it others. depends. Oh. I have a, another amendment. Yeah, but why don't you keep going? Why don't we let her keep okay. going? She has more to say. Yeah, I have all the fixes first. I mean, it's. I think you it's just read the fixes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. do it all as once. Yeah. Okay, as okay. I'm just going to do it from this the beginning. Like so, once. fundraising events. I would move to amend the policy to read as follows: fundraising events. Fundraising one word. The principal of a school is responsible for approving or denying a request for fundraising. Comma. If theirs is the only school involved. Period. Next paragraph: the superintendent or their designee. Is 
Okay. Is responsible for approving or denying a request for fundraising if more than one school is involved. Mm -hmm. Good enough? Good enough. That's not all in here. So somebody has to second that. Second. Second. So did you have a comment, Dr. Voss? I apparently have the wrong version. Yeah, okay. that's what we we're all saying. Know. We all have the there correction. Is no right version. Makes the newer one so much more special. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, amend to amend. Um, any comments about the amendments? Okay. All those in favor of the amendments, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So now back to the main motion, which is to approve the policy as amended. Um, any further comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving this as amended, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we're on to DKC. DKB or DKC? DKC is what I have. C is next. You just finished DFH. I will. Wrong um, okay, so we can go to policy DKC, expense reimbursements. Um, and that um, only has a small suggested, well, a few small suggested payment changes. Um, we had amended it to read um, personnel and school department officials who incur expenses in carrying out their authorized duties will be reimbursed by the school department in accordance with the travel policy set forth by the city of, of Northampton uh, upon submission of a properly completed and approved voucher and any supporting receipts required by the superintendent. Um, we added an S in the first sentence of the next paragraph. Uh, when official travel by personally owned vehicles is authorized. Mileage payment will be made at the rate currently approved by the city of Northampton. However, a monthly travel statement and an amount established by the committee will be paid to the superintendent, business manager, and others authorized by the committee through collective bargaining who are required to travel regularly within the school system on business. Um, and that was um, updated the mass MASC policy was updated in 2016. So could you make a motion to um, approve that with those I amendments? To approve policy DKC with those amendments. Second. Okay. Any, uh, Ms. Wysanski? So why is the third paragraph indented different, what, what's, what's happening in that last <laughs> paragraph? Is there a reason for that or? It's probably just been cut and pasted. In okay, that's, that's totally fine. fine. I just I, I didn't know. Like formatting goes off yeah. so easily if you, so. I can give you an official answer in one second. Mine's perfect, I don't know what you're <laughs> I don't. Build some glasses cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> and then, okay, so maybe we um, fix that. I think that that, yeah, so that's a it's formatting a, issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, just yeah. a no paragraph. It's just a no, paragraph. No, I think actually, I'm, Oh, you ask the hard questions. Yeah. So, Stumper. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Um, let me just check if you can. So close to voting. I think it really is just for many. And that paragraph is identical to that. Policy. If I had. And then I have a second one. Sure, <laughs> sure. Why don't you ask that one? Go with that together. one. Which is, just to be clear, that first sentence of the third paragraph, so a school committee member, in order to have their travel request reimbursed, has to have prior approval of the school committee. But have we, has, have any school committee members had their travel reimbursed and have we voted to reimburse? It? So that was the question that came up in subcommittee because of the way it's phrased about travel, yeah. Um, I don't know that anyone submitted their travel expenses. That's what I'm kind of so curious about. I usually about just it. pay for my own. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess. If Me too, but that right. doesn't mean so everybody else that does. If someone yeah. wanted them reimbursed, they would. Yeah, you want to keep that in. For the, for the yeah, and it's got to be the school committee. It can't be the superintendent approving it. Uh huh. So, so particularly that we're like because they be approving or? the travel of the school committee, which right? No, no, no. I'm fine with that. I just want to kind of clarify because I don't remember voting in the past, you know, three and a half years nobody, on any nobody, travel. Nobody, right? Nobody's put it in. <laughs> nobody puts it in. Okay. <laughs> and then it would have to be obviously budgeted. So we have to have a line item it that has money. Approved ahead of time. Before. 
for the school committee members. Right. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that policy. Just to clarify for full transparency, I do think there have been instances where school committee members have been reimbursed and it hasn't been voted on primarily because I wasn't um, focusing in on this policy. Um, so in the past, I think there may have been two or three times and my interpretation has been if there's been money in the school committee professional development line that hasn't been claimed, then I've been okay with, with uh, mm -hmm. sending that up for approval. But as we're now aware of this policy, I think that would have to change if this passes. And before, if someone is anticipating putting in a travel request, they would have to get authorization from the school committee to, to do that. Well, it's interesting because if a school committee member goes to a mass conference or workshop or a dance or whatever, we don't, we don't vote on it as a school committee for them to attend the professional development and that money is taken out of our professional development budget. So it seems a little odd that we would focus We'd zero in on travel. You know, it's interesting you say that because I'm pretty sure we're supposed to vote on the professional development things too. Well, I think that would when be I, really good to know. Like, no, going back <laughs> to it, I, I do think that, I mean, this is kind of why I want us to go through all of our policies mm -hmm. systematically. Um, but I do, I do think that I, well, maybe at the next meeting, uh, I will, I will look into that. Yes. But, um, we could all look into it, but, but it only that discussion makes sense. Because I mean, we only have, we have, a limited amount of money. Some of the yeah. conferences are very expensive, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you were to pay to fly and pay for lodging. Mm -hmm. um, just two people on a 10 person committee going could eat up the entire budget. So I do think that we should probably vote on it mm -hmm. um, to make sure that it's equitable and to make sure that one person isn't using all the resources or that we agree that you know, on a kind of plan of attack, is it better to have 10 of us go to one event or to divide it up so that there's always someone and, <laughs> and we report back? So, yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable to have the policy. Yeah, it's nice just if we have the policy, we should probably call it. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's, why, that's what I was really wondering about. Yeah. yeah. So I think that it was mostly most people. Those of us have just not asked for our tools. And okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I did get back there. I call the Jamaica conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did get back to you the answer. So the reason that the formatting is off is because the original policy was formatted differently yeah, and had different words. So. Do it. <laughs> so just to format. So it is. It's, it's, well, it's not just a format. It's also a change. It's a. It's a tiny change. Do you but you've read the change. Do you want? But so you, you read have, the change. You, have it. you read the change. You and have the change, change. But yeah. the change is on the format. It so we just it's, that's the idea. Yeah. It's, Great, it's fine. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. You all could do this. You could look at the policy. You could look okay. at the policy. You could compare it. Okay. Um, so there's been a motion made and seconded to approve this policy as as the amended as proposed amended by the committee and by Ms. Fallon. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. DKB. Last one. Salary deductions. Yes. The last one is um, policy DKC, um, no. DKB, salary deductions. Um, <laughs> so this is my favorite. <laughs> this, policy. this is a funny story. I love revision. <laughs> so this is one that I will be honest. You know, when we make these decisions, we weigh a lot of factors. First, we compare it to the current MASC policy, um, and we did, and they've eliminated it. Um, but then we always consult our experts and invite them to our meetings and. Um, Cami was at this meeting and she really did think that there it was important to just con to maintain the language that the school district shall not act as a collection, collection ag agent for an employee's debts except when it is required to do so by court order. Apparently it's an issue that does come up about please deduct this for my paycheck or that for my paycheck and so it's a very simple one-line policy that we're proposing and mm -hmm. quite honestly it, they do not have that. We're asking that you um, remove all the antiquated contract references and just put in these collective bargaining agreements and individual employee contracts. Um, but we do, and you know, keep the legal references, but we do think that it's important that if someone asks that we have the policy showing, like, I'm sorry, it's our policy that we do not do this. Mm -hmm. um, as a, And it's also our practice. So, so I would move to accept policy DKB as amended. Second. 
Any discussion on that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much uh, for those policy updates. Um, we now have the business administrator's report, and the personnel report, and the superintendent's report, and I believe you're now, Triple playing, now you're playing Cammy. That's right. Cammy. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, you have the monthly expenditure report in your packet. Um, there's nothing really noteworthy about it. Um, the, the bottom line is an appropriate level for this time of year. There are some individual accounts that are running negative balances at this time, but that will be resolved through transfers later on in the year. Um, so there is no, um, nothing that I need to advise the school committee about regarding monthly expenditures. Um, there, Cammy did not give a list of gifts that I accepted over $1,000, so I'm going to assume that I didn't accept any gifts over $1,000 since the last um, the last meeting. Um, you also see the payroll warrants, which were signed by your designee. Okay. Hearing no questions, I'll move on to the personnel report. You can see that we had 17 new hires and one separation. Um, that. Do not be alarmed about a potential loss of position control there. Um, the reason that we have so many more hires than separations is we started the year with several positions unfilled that were filled um, early on in the course of the month. So that's why those are there. Excellent. Okay. So then I'll go on to my superintendent's report. I'd like to start with an update on our transportation services. At the time of the last regular school committee meeting, there were four Durham buses without permanent drivers. Over the course of the last two weeks, permanent drivers have been placed on three of the four routes. B2 is the last route still needing a permanent driver. A potential driver for B2 has been identified. He has completed the 60-hour training and is awaiting a test date with the RMV. Yesterday, Durham experienced a high volume of driver absenteeism, which resulted in their calling in a substitute driver and navigator all the way from Framingham to cover B2. Um, so um, that did lead to some confusion. Today, a driver familiar with the route was back on B2. Um, the placement of permanent drivers on the other three buses has made a positive difference for students. I sincerely hope that the designated driver for B2 receives an early appointment and has a successful road test so that our children can experience greater consistency in their school transportation um, if they're riding Route B2. Next, I'd like to share some experiences from um, am I doing something else? No, no, no okay. I was just saying, I was just like, that, I think that was my kids. South Street neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. Okay, so next I'd like to share some of my experiences from the inaugural symposium of PEAS, which stands for In Pursuit of Equity, Accountability, and Success for Latinx Students in Massachusetts Schools. I chose to attend this conference because my great concern for equity in our district remains with our Latinx students, and especially for those who happen to be ELs. In a couple of weeks, I will share achievement data showing that in many places, our district students perform favorably compared not only to the district, not only to the statewide averages for their subgroups, but also for their comparable districts and comparable schools. Um, the notable exception are our Latinx students who tend to do worse in Northampton than in their peer districts or their peer schools. Um, and they also are the fastest growing population in Massachusetts public schools. So the importance of doing better for them is becoming a more urgent concern for me. And I would argue that it should be a much more urgent concern for the whole district. I was quite inspired by some of the tools and strategies that Dr. Estella Bensimon shared for implementing what she calls equity-minded teaching policy and leadership. I also attended a session run by the Springfield Public Schools on their 100 Males to College program, which just reaffirmed what I always felt, that our colleagues in urban districts have to work twice as hard in order to be recognized half as much. We can learn a lot from them. Um, 
we should not always look to the highest performing and high wealth districts for models. Um, I do think there's a little bit of arrogance in that, arrogance that I am guilty of myself. There are a lot of great models coming for us now out of districts that may not do so well on accountability reports. And um, it's too bad that Ann wasn't here to hear that because I think she happens to work in a, one of those districts that's doing great things but struggles um, because of the way we measure student achievement. Um, what I took away from the day was the need to make learning relevant for students. A theme that was reinforced this morning when Northampton High School student Lane Hall Witt addressed a room full of adults including other superintendents, the Massachusetts Secretary of Education, the director of the Rennie Center, and the executive director of the Urban League of Springfield on the conditions of education in Massachusetts. Um, reading the body language in the room, I think the adults were much more interested in what Lane had to say than what the secretary or anyone else had to say. Um, and what he said was exactly the same thing that the secretary of education had to say. And basically what I heard Pedro Nogueira say in his keynote at the Peace Conference last Friday, which was that our students need different learning experiences than the ones that many of us have had. They require more hands-on learning and more supportive environments and real direct connections to employment opportunities in the real world. Um, for them, the abstraction of taking a high-level course because it may increase their opportunities to get into a selective four-year college that may then lead to um, an opportunity in the real world is just too many steps away from the, um, the concerns that students are bringing and the, the, the buttons that we need to be pushing to keep them motivated in learning. Um, so I'm glad we've started down this path. And I think as we develop a more sophisticated, equity-minded way of thinking, we should continue to push for new ways of learning that may be more appropriate for students who are not doing so well with right now. Um, so to your point about other pathways, um, other um, internships, other ways of doing um, education, I'll just add um, sort of anecdotally, my conversation with interim principal Valancourt since the time of our last meeting when we were talking about enrollment of um, students in high level math courses or science courses which are the only ones that count on that report. Um, we were talking about looking at the whole range of experiences that fall into that category for the Department of Education. And there are a lot of courses that are considered high level math and science that aren't necessarily AP classes. Um, they're hands on learning experiences that um, we could build up from the um, from the coursework that we've already started with Project Lead the Way at the middle school. Um, so we are our conversations have been around, okay, how can we get more students involved in higher level courses by making the higher level courses more interesting for students? Um, so all these things um, are sort of coming together for me right now. Um, that's, that's really where my mind is and, and really where I think our um, needs are as a district and what I hope some of the discussion will be about in two weeks when we talk about MCAS scores. Thank you, Dr. Burlos. Um Let's see, uh, we, we have an executive session uh, that's uh, on the agenda. Um, we, we will not be coming back to the open session. Um, so our, we do have future business and meeting dates that are listed on the agenda uh, for all to read and see. Um, so I would, I would entertain a uh, motion to move into executive session. Make a motion to enter into executive session. Request for an ex executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 38, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Northampton Association of School Employees, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. The school committee will move into the adjacent area in the JFK Library during executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I need a roll call vote on this. Yes. Ms. Margarita? Yes. Ms. Rebecca Musanski? Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon? Yes. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Yes. Mr. Howard Moore? Yes. 
Susan Voss? Yes. Mr. Edward Zahowski? Yes. Okay. So I need to inform the public that we will be now moving into an executive session because to hold this conversation in open session would put our compromise our uh, bargaining position and then I also want to inform the public that we will adjourn directly from executive session and not return to open session so you don't have to wait for us to come back um, okay with that we will now move into executive session Great. 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 Great.